2013 at 7 p.m. And this is a regular meeting of the Cedarburg Board of Education, and it is a public meeting. And prior notices have been placed in the district, and additional copies were forwarded to the news graphic and Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And at this point, I'd like everyone to stand up, please, and join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, at this point, we're going to move on to item four, which is accepting the resignation of Mr. Troy Forrest from the school board. Uh, this is very bittersweet. I actually have Troy on the speakerphone right now. Troy, you want to say hi? Hi, guys. Good to be speaking about. All right, so those are perhaps your uh, last official words. <laughs> In your packets, you have the letter of resignation from Troy, and at this point, I will take a motion to accept his resignation from the Board of Education. I'm able to accept it with regret, but if you put it down, it has to stay there. I think so. I'll second it. If we vote it down, you have to stay. You have to come back. You've got to get on the red eye. It's not the first time you missed it. In fact. So, I have, a, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And uh, we have here a plaque for Troy. And he cannot be here. But there are three people here that are going to accept it for him. And uh, Callum, Hayden, Holly, please step up. So this is where your dad was all this time when he was gone from home, helping out the school district. So he's on the phone right now. And uh, this is this is an award of excellence. And, and this says for your service to the Board of Education, by word and deed, your presence has enriched the lives of students and served as an example for us all. There's your dad's name. And he was on the Cedarburg School Board. So will you accept this for your dad? And uh, I, for one, um, am really going to miss Troy and his insights. Um, I oh, get, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> so uh, I, for one, am going to miss Troy and his insights and uh, his contributions. And he's really done a lot. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the stuff that he has done. And then we do on the board, um, you'll never know. So um, your dad did a great job away. So you're really proud of him. Troy, you want to say anything? No, go ahead. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being very important as a board. Um, you know, I'm leaving the district and that I had the chance of having to be on the board today. And it's uh, just in February. Uh, um, and it's a good value to the board. And I'll tell you that uh, along with it, I'll be the administration. Thank you, Troy. They're all crying. <laughs>
pretty exhaustive um, interview process of candidates. And out of that, we were lucky enough to um, get Mark on the board. And as we all know and observe, we had a number of excellent candidates. And what I'd really like to do is uh, talk about the merits. And I know uh, there's some people that, that have some issues with, uh, with um, the procedure of doing this. Um, if you read the procedure for filling the board vacancies, one could extrapolate that we have the leniency to fill the board um, position. And um, as far as the one um, hitch would be the fact that it, um, someone could maybe say that it wasn't um, properly noticed. But um, this meeting, the fact that we we're discussing it and potentially filling that position, um, had been noticed um, in the meeting itself, in the meeting um, that's here. But um, I haven't uh, really thought of that angle much more than that. So um, I'll open it up for discussion. Rick, I know you have some thoughts on the matter. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's not because of, I want to make sure this is policy, not people are involved in it. Uh, we, we have great people that can apply. The filling board policy 133, um, the second paragraph of it, public notice of vacancy shall be given by the board clerk in accordance to established procedures. Uh, any qualified elector of the district may contact the board to express an interest in filing the vacancy. Um, we have board policy so that we follow it. We hold our employees to our board policy and our, our roles. <clears throat> um, as someone who has unfortunately do a lot of policies in my employment. Um, you want to make sure you follow them because if you ever get sued and you're deposed, which I have, you don't want an attorney, sorry Dave, to uh, ask you if you always follow your policies and not be able to say yes. Um, and then if you look at the second, the, the paragraph after that, candidates for a vacancy on the board shall be considered at an open meeting. Um, I don't think that that really is listing in the agenda. Um, our past practice has always been that we public noticed it by giving it to the newspapers and having them say, is there anybody interested in applying? And after that, then we go to 133, the rule, which does give us the ability to uh, make exceptions to that rule if we want. But the policy itself states that we must post the vacancy. And we can't post a vacancy until after you have it. And we didn't have that until a couple minutes ago. Okay. Does anyone else have any thoughts on the matter? Counselor? Well, I think my thoughts are, are what they <coughs> were at the uh, PNF meeting. Um, we rely on our administration to um, guide us on how these home policies are, are implemented, although the decision is ours, obviously. Um, I think we, we vetted the procedure uh, in that meeting. Um, six of the, uh, the members of the board were there, I believe. And we had a report from uh, Dr. Lamberson, not a formal report, but um, he, he explained that the, um, the, the um, Procedure of selecting the second or the runner-up person who we had vetted in open session um, would be permitted under the um, under the under the policies. And I think it was under the exception. Um, I don't remember exactly where it was, but there was a uh, um, perhaps it, it is the it's Oh, I see. Yeah, it's under the it's it's under it's under rule. rule. Right. And as far as the, uh, the point of there being uh, posted a notice of vacancy, if you look at the language of it, and now this is looking at this for the first time, it doesn't say notice of a current vacancy. Um, I think the notice, and this isn't a legal opinion to the district, by the way, <laughs> this is my personal opinion as a, as a citizen and school board member, not as a lawyer. I'm sure we have a bill if that <laughs> But um, <laughs> um, we did post notice of a vacancy. It wasn't notice of the current vacancy, it was notice of an impending vacancy. So 
stuff. I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the um, procedure we outlined. Uh, Anyone else? Have any thoughts? Yeah, I would say that, you know, since I'm supposed to be the one that would post this or have the responsibility, uh, I didn't quite look at it from this angle until this afternoon, and now with these comments. I would have a very difficult time as the president supporting it at this time with other folks. Okay. Just additionally, the, the not legal opinion from a, <coughs> on the table, the paragraph prior to this says that in the event of a vacancy, and I think you're splitting here as if you start adding things like current or past vacancy. What the intent of the policy is. And I did look into a very dictionary on, uh, online, and the word is shall. And shall says, used in laws, regulations, and directives to express what is mandatory. So I think it's mandatory that we post it, or we would have had the policy say should, which maybe we want to change the policy and have it say that. I guess I'm not quarreling with the shall. Um, I'm saying it was posted in, in my reading, but I understand your position. I can see that. Backing up a little bit, just some questions, or I'm just kind of doing the math on the sidebar here. It looks like it's in the first paragraph of the 133 billing board vacancies talks about if it's 120 days to the school board election, then left unfilled. That would have been like mid December. Day. It's April something, early April. April 2nd. Uh, so early December-ish would have been. OK, so we're months short of that. So then it seems like it talks about re referencing state law. We need to fill it in 60 days <coughs> of today. Okay, so that makes no fact. I just understand it. Um, I, I have another general question, I guess. We have two pages here. Filling board vacancies, 133, and then the procedures for filling board vacancies, which is 133 dash I don't know which one takes precedent. Um, in reading the first sentence of the rule, the following procedures shall be used by the Board of Education when filling a board vacancy, comma, except as otherwise provided by the current board. Which, to your point, maybe, does that supersede the first one or not? I don't know. The reverse. You have a policy, and then your rules are usually your procedure on how to do it. And I think that's why, and your procedures. It's normal to put in your procedure an exception like this has, so that you don't have to do it that way if something else comes up and there's extenuating the circumstances. But the policy, if you look at how our, our manual is set, the policies are listed first and the rules are after. And just a commentary, and, and, and to your point too, I have no issues with the candidates who ran, that they were all very good candidates. It is, in my opinion, the second worst job as a board member is to select somebody from our community. It's really difficult because you're representing, you know, the entire community on something, and there, you know, a lot of good people running. I really hate doing that. Um, so I was hoping, frankly, we were willing to say what we want to do, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. We have to do something in the next 60 days, um, so we'll need to, to step up and do it. You know, I, you, both sides are making very good arguments. I mean, I. I Totally comfortable with candidates who ran for. The only thing I, uh, I can add, I don't know about providing clarity or not, um, you'll notice in the policy in the second paragraph that the second paragraph is identical to the first point of the procedure. So the procedure says when a vacancy exists, then the board clerk shall publish the notice of the vacancy. Um, in the policy itself, it says public notice of the vacancy shall be given by the board clerk in accordance with established procedures. So, <clears throat> as, as we read this policy, the concern was, does the board have latitude to have a different procedure if you deem that appropriate? Um, because um, we would not, based on the procedure, we would not automatically post the vacancy uh, after tonight. Uh, we would wait to determine 
what you were going to do, how you wanted to do it, because in the procedure, it seems to provide you that latitude. So the posting seemed to, you know, and this may be an issue that the policy committee may want to bet a bit to bring things in alignment, but when we read this administratively, the rule seemed to, to the, the first issue that had to be resolved was are we going to uh, have a, a typical procedure of interview and notice, and if not, that that was, that was allowed um, because the notice came after the board would decide what procedure they wanted to follow. Um, that was in the you know, rule statement. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of clarity, I do think it was something the policy committee probably would want to vet a little bit. But just so that you know, administratively, we would not have published the vacancy after tonight without knowing how you wanted to vote. Because the procedure, you know, uh, had to clarify what your intent was in terms of that one. I don't know if that helps or makes it. Makes it uh, one thing I did not do, and I don't know if anybody else did, did anybody look at the legal references to see if the statute states that you have to post it? I did not. I did, I did, and I can't remember. You know, I, I believe, um, John, did you, because in the, in the PNF meeting, um, I think that was one of the questions I asked was, is um, is this would this um, uh, summary procedure pass muster with the, uh, the statutes in, in Utah? Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah, John? yeah, and uh, Conrad and I uh, discussed it, and from my recollection of our conversation, you had complete latitude in terms of how you want to fill it. There's no requirement that you interview uh, go through the kind of process procedure that you. Any other thoughts on the uh, procedures? Well, just one quick comment, too, is um, in today's society, I think it used to be that people never left like this. You just waited out your term and then you just didn't run again. But, you know, I can think of, I just started writing down names. There's five names since I've been on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's six. <laughs> you know, or you've been named on the board. So I think of five people who left the board for they moved, they, you know, so we went to the legislature, mostly people moving. And our society is so mobile nowadays that people come and go. And two, you know, three years is a long-term you know, commitment. And it is something we should probably consider going, it won't be the last time this happens. Um, whatever we do, I think we should look at it from a policy perspective and say, understand the laws and understand what the statutes say. Uh, because we did just did visit this recently, I mean, a couple months ago probably. Um, and that's to avoid the, the process. I mean, I, I am a little hesitant because I don't want to break, you know, some rule that we break and do that. I mean, are you looking, Conrad, to see where your notes are? Yep. Other people have comments. I'm just a little nervous to break the law. If we keep talking, to find something. <laughs> <laughs> Except this provided in some people. So I regret that uh, I, for one, didn't do my homework. Don't tell my kids that. But um, you know, there there are some people here that potentially would be considered. So depending on how this goes, I am um, I'm sorry. <coughs> ourselves time and to save the time of people who might be interested in positions. Let's get our lawyers to tell us what to do and what we can do in the, um, in the procedures. Because otherwise we're just going to be sitting here spinning our wheels until 9 o'clock and we've concluded that the statute is saying. That's my suggestion. 
same people who applied last time and then we can yeah. after we posted it we can do whatever we want on those it sounds from our policy because we can make an exception to it and we can pick anyone we want out of there as long as we do it at a public meeting. Right. It's just the posting part of our policy so that we don't violate our policy. Post it Make it a very short window, whoever applies, and then let's select somebody. And the board, the way this is written, the board has the ability to select how that process goes. The board could say, it's the same candidates as last time we're taking, you know, the next runner up or whatever. And we can do that. I think we don't know. I think that's the problem. Mm -hmm. okay, let's that out. Well, would anyone like to make a motion in that regard then? Either way, which more or less you guys are kind of saying the same thing. To post or to contact the council or to do both. I'll make a motion that we post the vacancy and ask the legal council for guidance on how we have to how we have to fill the position within those within the legal requirements. I'll second that. Any discussion? In the discussion item, if we post this, the items under the 133 rules section talk about prospective candidates shall be interviewed by the board at a regular meeting. Um, that's an item two. Item four says, like we've done it always in the past, they'll be interviewed individually. Um, we no talks about how we narrow the candidates down. Um, so I, if, if we're posting this, I would hope we follow the regular procedures that we've done in the past and not just post it and say, okay, And again, I really hate doing that. I'm sure none of it as much as Christy will after tonight. <laughs> Very sorry. Um, again, this should have been um, vetted before we got to this point. I apologize that we dragged it off tonight. I'm sorry. So, with that I'll, said, I'll on that posting. what if we done with the story? We, we don't know. Yeah, we just post it and then give it to the other one. Was it one last time? Again, we don't know. Yeah. We have to find out. Yeah. 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 So we should, what you're saying, Mr. President, is stay consistent with what we've done in the past right now. Uh, so that's what Kevin said. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that's not in the motion. So that yeah. was just in the discussion. I So I think we, we just post it, and uh, there's no regulation on posting or how long after it is posted. Well, but it has to be filled within 60 days. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let that drive the process. Then. So time for posting to give us enough time to get candidates for the next meeting. Yeah, interview all that stuff. All right. So motion and a second. All those in favor? Summer baseball all conference selections. Uh, Jonathan Stever in first base infield. 
Mike Wolke, second team catcher. Um, excuse me, Steer was first team in field. Wolke was second team catcher. Taylor Grimm, honorable mention for first base. Jake Wallach was honorable mention for the outfield. And Drake Daniels was honorable mention for the utility. Um, and then this, just now this fall, congratulations to the girls' tennis state qualifiers. Jennifer Spineski, who's a um, sophomore in singles. Uh, Lauren Weising and David Wilkinson. Lauren's a sophomore, David's a senior. Uh, they took sixth place at the state tournament in doubles. Um, and then the 2013-2014 all-conference cross-country selection. Jack O'Neill was first team, who's a sophomore. Sydney Frank, first team, who's a junior. Um, Rain Tenpenny, who's a freshman um, on the second team. And Tanner Mantel was on to mention, I believe Tanner's a senior. Um, in that sense, so congratulations to those kids. And then three of those students also qualified for state, which is this Saturday. Uh, Sydney Frank uh, took fourth at sectionals. Rain Tenpenny took seventh at sectionals. And Jack O'Neill took third. So we had a junior take fourth, freshman take seventh, and then a sophomore boy take third. So congratulations to them. And, um, very exciting in that sense. Um, and um, also then congratulations to the girls' state uh, golf team, state qualifier, Lee Bowman, who's a sophomore. And then congratulations to 2013-2014 all-conference girls um, selection. Kelly Verbeck, who's a senior, was first team. Um, two things we don't have mentioned is our marching band, which took third place um, at Whitewater just a couple weekends ago um, and um, had posted their highest score ever right before state. So um, I know you have 30-ish students involved. It's over 10% of our student body involved in the marching band. So we're going to do so well. It's, it's pretty awesome. And then our state soccer, we are just our boys' soccer team, which since it was printed, um, they uh, have um, qualified for the state soccer tournament for the first time in 17 years. And so they play this Friday um, at 12 o'clock at Eline Field. And if they win, they would play um, Saturday at 2 o'clock. And they play Whitefish Bay. Um, so North Shore is, was well represented in that, that tournament. Um, but it's a uh, they lost to them earlier, previously this year, 2-0, so there's a possibility of a win winnable game. Sounds like a winnable game and possibility of maybe making the finals. So in the semis at Eline Field on Friday. So a lot of good things happening at the high school. And volleyball just lost in the second round. So I think it's the best fall sports season we've had in like forever. Um, you know, in the five years I've been. That's sort of like probably since Kevin Kennedy was one sport. Give me a perspective. Joel, Joel Perry, who's the principal of Germantown, did give us a compliment. He said we've turned into like the the, the U of the North Shore. Uh, you know, Arrowhead is like the, the U. They call that the U. So uh, we've sort of been playing well right now. Football plays on Friday night in the second round of the playoffs um, at Kimberly. So there's um, just a lot of cool things happening in, in the high school. I will not see if there's a policy that makes Kevin happy since I have to be as much about that not going down. Next person is requesting to address members of the Board of Education. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to? Okay. All right, I'm going to read a brief statement. If you could just stand up here, and when I'm done talking, if you could state your name um, and your address. And I'm going to read the public comment disclaimer. In the past, the State Attorney General issued guidance on how governmental bodies, such as school boards, should conduct the public comment, comment portions of their meetings. This guidance was given to assist governmental bodies in avoiding violation of the state's open meeting laws. The essence of this guidance is that, unless the topic being brought to the board by the public is listed on that meetings agenda, no significant discussion can be held on that item. Instead, the topic may be listed on an item on a future meeting agenda, whereby discussion could then be held. The reason for this guidance is not to limit open discussion, but rather to ensure that all interested parties have equal opportunity to participate in the discussions with the full school board. We on the school board encourage community input, and we want to hear from you, our constituents. However, we also take the state's open meeting laws seriously and will follow the guidance as outlined by the state attorney general. Therefore, if an item is listed on tonight's agenda, open dialogue may occur between the individual from the public and the board members. If it is not listed, the board will be limited to listening only and will not be able to respond to comments or questions. If your item is not listed on tonight's agenda, and you want to have a discussion regarding the topic, you're encouraged to contact the district superintendent and request that your item be listed on a future meeting agenda. 
As always, you are also encouraged to discuss any issue with individual board members on a one-on-one -on -one basis outside the meeting setting. Please make your comments to the board and not to any individuals in the audience. Please note that this is a public meeting and we ask everyone to address one another with courtesy and respect you would like to receive in return. When you approach the microphone, please state your name and address for the record. As a reminder, this meeting is being videotaped and will be broadcast via the local cable channel. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mark Harris. I live at W59 and 975 Essex Drive in Cedarburg. And I'm just asked for a few minutes tonight just to bring up the issue of class sizes. Um, this is something that some Parkview parents recently spoke with the superintendent about. And unfortunately, I missed that PTA meeting, but I was inspired to just come for a couple minutes. Um, I have two daughters. One has just finished uh, her complete education here in Cedarburg and is a freshman in college. And the other one is in third grade, which gives me, if you could do the math, which and 10 years of separation between the two of them. When my first daughter went through, her kindergarten size was class was 16 students. She goes to Park East School, by the way. And her third grade was 21 students. At the time, in addition to the teacher, there was a half-time aid available at each grade level. When my current daughter, younger daughter, went through, her kindergarten size was 23 students. And her third grade class is 28 students, which I believe is right on the edge of the maximum size that the school district is trying to keep. Um, it is striking to me that the teacher and the principal have done a wonderful job given the additional class time, that, or the, the additional students and the relative reduction of our staff to help in the classroom. But this is still a concern for me. And the other aspect of this is that, based upon my acquaintance with her classmates, my kindergarten classmate and my older daughter's classmate, the current students seem to have far more social and professional needs than was the case 10 years ago. And when I looked at the report card from the district by school, that seemed to be the pattern. So we have students who need more attention and effort, more of them, in classrooms that are larger with less teacher support. And clearly this is a, a matter of concern for me as a parent. My daughter is one of the children. Um, I don't say this really as a criticism. Again, of the principal and teachers. We have had remarkable support from the principal. But at the rate that the class sizes continue to increase, we are right up against what the policy is that we've been told for the national class size. And as a parent, I feel like I have to and say something tonight. I recognize this is on the agenda, and we can, uh, this maybe will be a topic for a future discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Kelly Laporta. I live at W71 and 661 Harrison Avenue in Cedarburg. Um, my son is also in the third grade at Parkview. Um, Dr. Lankerson, thank you very much for the amount of time you spent with us the other night at the PGA meeting. We really appreciate that. Um, class size is really an issue at Parkview. Um, the teachers and the principal, again, as <coughs> he just said, are doing a fabulous job, but 28 kids in a classroom is too many. It's affecting the kids. There's quite a few kids in the class that need more attention than what they're getting. And it's not fair to the kids or the teachers. And we know that we're right up the edge. And if we split, we're too small. And that math doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. So we're just hoping that the dialogue will start. And hopefully we can find a happy resolution for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone at all? All right. <clears throat> then we will move on to the next item, the consent agenda. Dr. Lamson. Uh, as noted, the minutes of September 17th.
17, Budget and Finance. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we'd be more than happy to um, respond to those. Uh, Karen is prepared, and the personnel report uh, is updated at your place this evening. And we recommend approval of the consent agenda. Acceptance of donation is the recommendation of the board accept and recognize a donation of $800 in candy bars from the master screen print and bravery to be used by Seabrook High School for earning the highest accountability score in the state as reported on the most recent state school report card and we recommend approval. Move to approve. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Courses and this evening, uh, we have an update uh, for the board members' request back in August. They want to get an update on uh, grading in particular. How was the board going to assess the students at that time? So, this evening, we have Tony DeRosa, the uh, Upstate Middle School principal, here to present Upstate Transition. skills, team building and working in groups, and time management. 
of your career will be working on career clusters, multiple intelligences, learning styles, and we'll be working on the Naviance online program, which they also use at the high school. Emotional and social will be um, covering things like healthy relationships, bully prevention, cyber bullying, anger management, um, we have the courage retreat um, scheduled for all seventh graders in February. Um, we started that last year and we'll continue it this year. We get support from the high school to um, bring this program to our school as well. Um, also we'll address coping with stress, character education, and self-esteem. The grading policy and practices, we've got, um, as with all the classes, the practice is 10%, and that would include things like group, group work, um, class work, entrance and exit slips, warm-up activities, worksheets, and journaling. The benchmark or formative assessments would be 30%, and that again would include entrance or exit slips, problem solving activities, journaling, activity sheets, performance tests, individual assessments and reflections. Our summative assessments at 60% would include unit and topic assessments, performance assessments, presentations, outcome assessments, and visual presentations. So then I just brought a few examples of uh, a practice at 10%. Um, this is from one of the programs that we use called Second Step Program. And I don't know if the, if the board wants a copy so they can see it a little bit closer, but I give a packet. If you don't really hand those out, I can. But that's just an example of a 10%. So that's um, something that the students did on coping, learning what is cope, how, coping, how do you cope with stress, and other um, obstacles in your life. Um, so it's just sort of a practice thing um, that they work on. The back side of that sheet has them um, working on groups and analyzing problems and how to do problem solving. to the benchmark. Um, just one example of a benchmark that we would use at, at 30% would be um, another lesson that I took from um, the second step program on dealing with bullying. So that's um, giving them tips and then having them write something that students could say or do how to how to respond to bullying, um, getting help, etc. Um, on the back of that there's additional practice on um, recognizing bullying. And then an example of a 60% summative assessment would be this, this is what the students are working on right now. Um, so they're spending some time, the class is in the computer lab. So they're able to use the computers. Um, and then they're taking from these five topics at the bottom of the sheet, um, the main things we've worked on so far this, this first quarter were the apathy, communication skills, stress management, anger management and bully prevention. So they're picking two of those topics and then writing to, doing a little bit of research, um, going from things that they already know that we've learned in class and the things that they can learn um, online and then writing two paragraphs about it. Talking about how they would use this life skill, um, what would help them manage um, through situations that may, may be difficult to them and then uh, retell an event or something they experienced. So that's, those are just a few examples. Do you do any role playing or anything like that? We have a lot of group working. The kids love the role playing, so we try to do that. Kind of change it up a little bit. So are there any other methods besides role playing and then following through with these? I'm sorry? Is there any other um, methods of instruction that you have other than role playing and then this document? We, Right. Um, well, each of the lessons coming from Second Step is a, is a, um, a video-based program, so there's little clips that we watch, and then we stop, and then we discuss whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of group work, a lot of discussion, a lot of um, participation in groups, and I, and I like to kind of check it out as they leave class, so they'll do exit slips a lot. Um, try to... Um, to um, appeal to the multiple intelligences, so to change it up um, to make it interesting to all students. So 
too many by the group. Part of what we're trying to do is to learn how to work in groups sure. um, because it's a lifelong skill that, that they will need. Um, developing empathy, communication skills. Um, so hopefully those are some, some little things that we're doing in the class that are going to help them bridge that. I for one, I think this is great stuff. I think uh, all these different concepts that you have there are real roadblocks to learning. Yeah. Thank you. Is this something that all the all the seventh graders? All the seventh graders, they, yeah. They take it? Yes, they do. How much how much uh, like school time is dedicated to this? Um, it's it's one semester long, and it meets every other day. So every. Oh, it's substantial. Then. It's yeah, two days two days a week or three days a week, yeah. depending. I have just a comment. I, I also think it's really a great program to do. It's an addition of you know math. And but it's such an important part, especially, you know, as kids, you know, seventh, eighth grade freshmen in mm -hmm. high school and things like that. But the one comment I had, and it's not in the, at all in the way, uh, when I'm looking at the, the benchmark, 30%, I kind of made a note to myself, but the tip number three, um, and I appreciate the reason that it's there, but you know, telling the person who are bullying you to stop, I mean, I kind of question that, to be honest with you. Like, a bully I've found, like, a bully's a bully. And if it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's very difficult eh, for the student who's being bullied to say, just stop. You know, right. do that. I, I found far more success, and hopefully we do this in the classroom, far more success if other friends in that group or observers say, hey, knock it off. A third party disinterested just happens to observe it, says to the bully, knock it off. And, and I found, I think that's far more successful. Exactly. Than the the, the so role of bystander. Yeah, the bystander and you know, friends in the group that see yeah. the text messages. And they can, if they have the willpower, just they're in the third party to say and knock it off. Absolutely, and we really, we really reinforce that piece. Right. That the role of the bystander can't be, um, it can't be expressed how important that is. It, it also says in there, um, tell the bully to stop if you feel safe and confident and comfortable. So it's not always safe for them to say to the bully to stop. One on one, it's difficult. Yeah. To do that. So, just, yeah hopefully Thank you. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to give uh, you know some credit to 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 Jill for really shouldering a lot of the, the curricular load and this course is a little bit different than we would consider a traditional content based course and so uh, you know to me, this is really more about the application of for the kids to be able to internalize this for, for how they learn. You know, as we talked about when we went through the, the approval process, that seventh grade year being so critical. And, you know, as we talked about you know, mental health issues and anxiety issues and school anxiety issues, you know, this, this class is a great vehicle to address a lot of those uh, concerns that oftentimes kids have in middle school. And, and our counselors have done a fantastic job of working with our kids you know, through this class to, to teach some of those uh, skills and coping strategies. So thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.
with that said. Yeah. No action, no action this evening. No action this evening. No action this evening. Just information. Um, in the packet, you will see the request, uh, project uh, request for a TID. Um, the new name for the old TIP, Tax and General Finance uh, Financing, as opposed to Tax and General District. Um, the, uh, there is a board meeting, joint uh, board meeting public hearing uh, that's noticed on the front sheet. Uh, we will be present uh, as a district administratively at, um, at those uh, meetings. Uh, I simply want to uh, alert you based on the documentation that there is a section of property identified in the map um, that is being considered to be set aside as a, as a tip. Just curious, does every does everyone feel that you're at a pretty high level of knowledge of what a TID is or does? That we don't need to cover it. I'm not. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna have to you gotta break down for me. No, that's that, that's fine. Let, let, I'm gonna start and I'm gonna ask anyone else please to jump in, if you don't mind. Um, the uh, the purpose of a TID uh, is to set aside the property for development so that the future value of that property greatly exceeds the current level and the projected level under its existing use. So in this example, um, the area has to be designated, quote, blighted. The value of that property is established on page 11 in red under estimated, um, or maybe under valuation data, they're very close. Uh, the projected base value of the district currently is 245,471 on page 11. Um, and then there's another estimated valuation. The, the hope for goal is that after this property is developed, that the value of that property will greatly exceed that dollar amount. Now, in order for that to happen, uh, a developer may need some incentive to develop the property. Um, either a, uh, some fees either waived or reduced for improvement uh, in order to develop the property in a way that he or she has deemed it appropriate and approved by city ordinance. Um, in this situation, you can see some of the tables for projected valuation. Um, the way this works is that the school district, if this is approved, um, that designated footprint of property will be frozen for property tax value to the school district for an extended period of time. Um, because it's very possible that the developer may spend a sizable sum to develop that property. And uh, however, when that property is developed and the valuation continues to increase, if there was any um, capital improvements that were funded either by debt service or whatever it might be that have to be paid off during a particular time frame, um, the increase or the delta in the valuation will, will be collected in taxes, but it will not go to the school district and the other taxing bodies uh, MATC, et cetera, it will go to the city. And the city will use that to fund the improvements to that property until the improvements to that property expire, the cost of that. Um, and uh, in, uh, I believe, current regulations, there's a yearly audit, like we call it, I believe, um, that's required. A yearly, a yearly audit goes to us, it goes to the joint. Uh, review board so that we everyone can know that the value of the value of that property uh, and the property taxes that are paid by the owner of that property indeed in excess of the 245 471 that those property taxes indeed go for the expressed intent of developing that property once all the expenses are paid then that property comes off the TIB and the value of that new property comes on to our tax rate. 
um, the developer is still paying that tax, but instead of a pretty decent portion going to the city to pay for, for the improvements, those dollars will then go to the other tax and entities. Is there anything else? Did I miss anything or any other That's clarification? Good. I understand. That. That's good base. Yeah. yeah, just that the, uh, the time period is for 15 years. Is it just 27? Usually yeah. it's 26. It's most likely not going to be that. Yeah, projection. Yeah, the projections are showing. Yeah, they're, they're, the specifics are still being ironed out. Yeah. Be, they, were, they were talking about it in a proposed session last night at okay. the council meeting, but I, I wasn't there. So they're uh, going over some issues right now, so I, I really don't know what was said. But I know that it's not finalized yet. They're still talking about you know, those numbers. This is the length. And the issue is, if it can be developed without a kid, we get the money All the right, right, right away. Right. What do we get right now? On that one? It's like, it's like um, the total tax in there is like $4,000, I think, something in that area. So our percentage is small. Yeah. Exactly sure. That wouldn't change, obviously. Right, we did freezes. Yeah. So the, um, I just don't know if, if the school board in the past has taken a definitive position on TIDs, uh, some tax and bodies do. I, uh, uh, I will simply refer to your good pleasure, but I just don't know what the history has been um, regarding, regarding um, you know, these kinds of issues. I believe we have to sign off on it since we're more taxing it. It's just mm -hmm. up our tax. Yeah, that's the exact review board. Right, right. So, the, yeah. 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 so the, the joint review board um, is scheduled for the fourth, number fourth. Um, I'm not going to go. Strategic comments I'd like to throw to the board. And, and actually, I'd like, I think ultimately the whole board has to vote on this. Yes. I think. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, just a couple comments I have on tips in general. I mean, statewide, there's a number of them that are underwater. You know, the concept works really well that when you build it, they'll come and they're going to increase the value, and that, that will pay the bonds back with the city issue for the infrastructure, <coughs> sewer, water lines, whatever. But, you know, when the economy turned south, tips that got approved. Nobody built on So you've got bonds out there that can't meet their debt service. I don't know if Cedar Park has me now. I don't track it very closely. Um, but statewide, that's an issue because there's not bonding for this. Now, that's a taxpayer issue. It's not really a school district issue. But it says instead of getting it done in a projection of 15 years, yeah, I think have like 27 years to pay it back. So it's a generation to pay these bonds back. Um, the In general, when you see TIFs utilized, I mean, in our world, we see them utilized. And generally, cities look for them and say, or school boards say, all right, is it, they call it the same every time, a catalytic project. Is this development going to spur increased values in the neighborhood and down the street, up and down the street? If we fund this one, it'll help the neighbors and everybody else's values go up. And then in that concept, the school district and the city increase the property tax rate and everybody benefits. So, you know, there's, there's good about TIFs. I'm not a, I'm not against them. Um, I would, as a school board member and a taxpayer, putting both hats on, I'd say, is this a catalytic? I don't I have no idea what's planned here. Is this a catalytic project, or is this just a way to get a building on a site? I mean, are we, but for this funding, I don't know how long this individual has owned or company has owned the land. Um, it looks like in the, in the beginning part, it's, it's got some pollution on it. And, you know, typically you do due diligence on that. I don't know if this pollution was known. I think that was a gas station when I grew up here. Um, which generally, yeah, it was, it was Rick Chevrolet and then Newman Chevrolet. Um, I think everybody thought that there was probably pollution there. Um, they, they didn't test it or? Yeah. Okay, they didn't. So, okay, usually you buy the property 
based on a lower value because you've got pollution there. And I wonder, and I don't own any properties down there, but I wonder if I'll be creating a situation where we're subsidizing retail on one lot at the detriment to retail down the street. I mean, it's a, it's a question, and frankly, I would hope the full board ends up voting on this. I wouldn't feel comfortable going and trying to let him at the Packer game because I, I would want the whole board's input on this. But, you know, there, there are general questions when you do these tests because we are foregoing income for up to 27 years. We get the same amount we have now, but of course, we look at, we're talking about our budget in a few minutes. When's the last time none of our costs went up? I mean, they always go up. Utilities go up, everything goes up. And it's more a philosophical issue. I don't think it's a big dollar amount. I'm not against, I have no idea what this tip is planned to be. Don't know anything about it um, right now. But is this block of land creating value for our community that we should be subsidizing? And what's the value of the tip? Is it a million dollars or something? That, I think, yeah. so, I mean, the amount that the, the bonds are going to be. And then the other question that I have while I'm on my soapbox is, um, and again, it doesn't really impact, it does impact us because we're the biggest, we're the largest tax charge in the city's second to us, probably, in the taxes that they charge. Um, generally, we used to ask a lot of questions about what's included in the project, TIF. Like, what's, what's the city subsidizing? It looked like some of it was developer incentives of $250,000. I'm not sure if that's accurate. I would, you know, generally, when I'm on the other side of the table, you want TIF money going for bricks and mortar infrastructure, not, you know, something that does create value, not to somebody's pocket for a development that they're going to, that they're promising. So if that's accurate, that's on page 15. And I'm not sure if that's part of this or not. Are we funding a TIF so that the developer can get paid to develop a building on a site that he's got pollution on? And, and should the taxpayers be funded that? A lot of uh, the, sorry for interrupting, but a lot of discussion on this is because um, part of that parcel is in the historic district. So it's on Washington Avenue, the corner there across from uh, Tri-City where the farmer's market is um, and where the ice cream was in the winter. And um, there is the opinion of some people that when you build something new in the historic district, it's not as if you were going to build it next to the pig or, you know, um, like the new Walgreens that went up, right? You're building there. You can look however if you really want it to, right? So you're not going to let you build it there. But it has to be pleasant and just your boilerplate Walgreens went, went up there. Well, you're not going to be able to put a building like that in the historic district, right? So, the Landmarks Committee, the Planning Commission, and the city are going to put some restrictions on that. And in order to pay for that, some developers feel that, you know, it, the TIT is necessary to make up for that cost. So, but for the historic district, they would be able to build a building, they'd be able to do it in a, in a way that they could charge rent and they could pay the building off. But now it's in a historic district that's a little bit harder. So this softens that blow. That's one of the arguments there. Does that make sense? The other, the other side of the argument would be when you purchase a property in that type of district, buyer be there. Absolutely. No, it, 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 very much aware. So I, that, that point would strike home with me, saying if, yeah. if the city has a bunch of other requirements that are going to make it more, much more expensive to build there, okay, I can understand. You know, hopefully they get to charge rent that equals that, but if they can't, all right, the city wants it for the charm and character of Main Street, okay? That makes sense. But again, what I'm just throwing out there, I don't know a ton about this. It's still very early on. Um, and I would have a bunch of questions. I wish I could go to the meeting, but I can't. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have <laughs> <laughs> you don't know these guys. So with that said, can anyone attend that meeting on the fourth? Delegate. Someone who's not here tonight. That'd be good. <laughs> Troy. <coughs> Troy. <laughs> oh. well, we'll have a representative. Anyone can attend. If you're going to attend, to attend. Yeah, I know. Otherwise, it's a guy who Never Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the time yeah. frame for when the city wants to get this? Um, I have other questions, but I think I'd rather wait. And, and Kevin made some very good points as far as where's this going to go, and I think that's what I need to know. Is so I guess my big question: What's the time frame to the city have an idea right now? Well, none of it's been approved, right? right? So nothing's been approved. So it's just in the the only thing the city has really done right now has done something in closed session that they don't know about, and um, appointed. 
ends on an open session. Uh, I believe to the uh, position or considered on where they mentioned it before I left. Um, so I don't I don't know if uh, I don't know if that happened. I'd like to be for this discussion. But that's the only thing they've done. So as far as how soon this can take place, it all hinges on the vote. I mean they, they haven't even really said in public whether they like the idea or not. But that to me is an important issue because I, I really like our relationship with the city and the town. Mm -hmm. We get along great with both groups. I really I cherish that and I think that's very important to do. If, if, if they came to me and said, Kevin, if there's a million details you don't know about, we really, really need this, it's great for our city, that would mean a lot to me. But right now, you know, this update just gives me some numbers, I don't know what it stands for, it's very, I'm glad we don't have to go with this tonight. But I would like yeah. to get the feedback and, you know, the city feels very strongly it's something they need. I'd like to, you know, help things in with the town. But I, I just have a bunch of questions when we do this. There'll be a lot more information for them coming out, so. Okay. So then all this point. So if anyone can go, it should be riveting. If not, John from the Miss the Packer game. It's a bear's game anyway. That's why. It's a bear's game. It's a bear's game. It's a bear's game. It's a Packer bear. It's all for you guys. Here you go. You might have to keep it. Thank goodness for keeping your arms. That would be a bit of a weekend. Does anyone have any other questions on that? Not at this time. If you do, you can talk to John um, in the city, uh, Christy, Mertis is good to talk to, and of course, Kenzo would be good to talk to. Okay. And those matters, painting should come up. Um, if, you are, um, if you are doing um, email or anything like that, just include uh, John so he can be declaring house of all information in regards to the um, school board and um, the city. So, Moving on to item F, board policies, second reading and or approval, Joe. No.
I'll review what we discussed at the staff meeting. Um, we did receive from the packet uh, a memo describing the tax levy adjustment and the amendment that goes along with it. Each year at this time, the board is asked to amend the budget and um, changes to the tax levy and state aid amounts. As we discussed, DPI is required to certify aid to the district by October 15th. They did do that. Um, Scott Walker did put a proposal out in early October, and that was approved on October, it was signed into law on October 20th, and what that did is it added $40 million um, to, um, to A for school districts, and it's called the 2013 Act 46. They were certified that to us by October 31st. Um, we thought we were going to have to have a special meeting in November. We did receive that certification on the 23rd. So in your packet, we did receive all the adjustments due to that. This amendment um, and certification does require a two-thirds two vote of the school board, and then we have to post the amendment within 10 days. I'll briefly go over the, the background, which we did discuss. One of the items we do in October is we finalize the third Friday counts, and we were projecting resident enrollment to be down 45 students this year, and it was down 40, so we made that adjustment. Um, because our revenue limit is um, a three-year rolling average, we actually lost a little bit of money in our revenue limit due to that, but um, the defined enrollment helps to keep that The next item is the equalized value on October 1st. The Department of Revenue did certify uh, to DPI. Um, we were projecting a 0% increase. It was actually 0.3%, 0.36% increase. Going to the second page of your memo, this laid out um, equalization aid. As you know, July, um, there's a July estimate from DPI that's based on budgeted numbers. That's what um, we used in the estimate at the budget hearing in August. The projection was our equalization aid would be down 8.1 percent, or 725,000. At that time, during the PNF meetings, we did discuss. I expected it to be up about 200,000, just due to our actual numbers would come in, and it was up actually on the October 15th certification. It was up 231,000 dollars. Then we have the October 31st um, estimate, which was. Um, recalculated due to the 2013 F46, and that actually increased our July estimate by $447,944, which means our tax levy will decrease due to that. Some other items we discussed at PNF and questions from board members thereafter was our fund balance. Um, <coughs> currently our fund balance is 23%. The board did last year approve 410,000 out of the fund balance for security projects. We did par part of that last year, and the portion that remains this year is $241,156. We also talked about what our future expenditures out of our fund balance. Our fund balance policy says we need to maintain 15 to 20 percent, and John presented, I believe it was last year to be announced. Um, some of the items on the horizon, and one of them is the um, varsity tennis courts, and that will cost us about $250,000. we are looking to do that in 2015. And some other um, larger dollar items are the aging um, air, condi air conditioning units at Parkview and Thorson, and also the district office. We have the original unit in there, so those are some things that we do. We looked. Those are some things on the horizon um, for fund balance because we do use fund balance for one time, non recurring items. Um, the next item is we also talk about just the mill rates of other surrounding districts. We haven't done that before, so we took a look at 16 districts in the surrounding area, and um, those graphs were included again for your information. And last year, our tax rate was 9.55, and that we were the third lowest. And we also um, 
pull some information from DPI. All the K-12 districts, which is 230, pardon me, 268, and those were, we ranked them from low to high, and Cedar River was um, low at 104. As you know, we, we use our budget reconciliation spreadsheet throughout the budget process, and this year we did receive over and above the revenue limit, we received a separate categorical aid of $75 per student on our three-year rolling average. So that brought us about $216,000. So our, our, after all of our adjustments were made for salaries, benefits, open enrollment, things like that, we ended up with a positive $121,000. And because we want it, we always recommend utilizing our full revenue limit authority. We looked at what what's on the horizon that we could use that use that money for. And John Lamberson talked about um, a learning initiative and, and computers in the classroom and um, how we would start that process. So our recommendation would be that we utilize that remaining 121000 for this learning initiative project. Then the third page of your memo starts to discuss the um, tax levy scenarios, and I did pass on a new one with the fifth one that we discussed at the p and meeting. I'll just briefly walk through those. On your spreadsheet, the gray, the gray highlighted in gray is the budget here. At that, at that point in time, with the estimates, the tax rate increase was 9.59%. The yellow one is our October 15th certification of the, um, equal, equalization aid. I wanted to put that on here so we have a historical um, piece of information before the additional funds were added from the new law. That brought our tax rate down to 8.01%. Then you'll see the next five scenarios. The first one is tax levy scenario one. This would be utilizing full revenue limit authority in all funds, fund 10 and our debt service fund. The tax rate would be 6.92%. The second one we discussed tonight is the pink scenario. What that does is it utilizes funds out of our debt service that we have accumulated over the years, and we have about 175 in there. This took 150,000 of that to decrease our tax levy. Scenario three, the green scenario, took that same 150,000 out of debt service. Plus, it said, let's not levy to our full authority and use the 121,000 to decrease the tax levy. And that percent is 5.57%. The next one, which is purple, tax levy scenario number four. That said, says, let's utilize everything we have out of our debt service, which is 175,000. And 20, and use 21,000 of the 121,000 positive budget balance, which brought the tax rate to 6.18%. And then tonight, after further discussion, and all of these were discussed at the PNG um, last week too, or the week before, the last scenario is using 175,000 out of our debt service, so we got the rate by 175,000, and we fund 10 and 10, and put um, the hundred, full 121,000 towards the learning initiative. Where the green scenario would not allow us to do that. Can you just, because we went over this in PNF from a public standpoint, John, would you just care to talk about the learning initiative? as to what we talked about in the PNF sense. You'd like to read? I'd like to read your digest version. Okay, time. okay. Um, what we talked about is a learning initiative that would allow the school district to move from its current uh, computer hardware configuration into a shared use. That is, we have computer labs, or we have a designated number of computers in the classroom, uh, three, five, whatever it might be for a class of 25 or 28, um, that need to be shared. Um, those resources have to be scheduled and they have to be distributed among an entire student body in the school. What we would like to think about and have a conversation about is moving from a shared use 
to what is referred to as a designated use, which means that students have ready access to um, computer device, uh, to that hardware when they need it, which in our view will be almost all the time, um, just like the rest of us. And uh, the uh, conversation we've had is uh, to try to determine what grade levels might be best. Uh, but uh, this clearly is a learning initiative because we truly believe that learning uh, will change dramatically uh, and improve dramatically with this resource being available and predictable uh, in the classrooms across the school district at some point. I just want to say that um, whatever scenario we go with, if you go back to the 2009-2010 year, and you look at the taxes that the school district is no matter what scenario we go with, we're still between 1 and 3 percent lower than that tax year of 2009-2010 because of what this board has done over the years. So let's keep that in the back for a minute. I just felt that it was good that both John and Karen had touched on the technology piece. So that's really what we're looking at, at least at my view of the board. We talked about it at PF quite a bit. Is we're looking at what is the best ways to enhance education for the kids. That's what John really, that's why he said the Reader's Digest, because I think you could have gone on for about an hour with the details of your thinking and where you want to go. And that would have been just the introduction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into the meat of the issue. We're excited about the opportunity to have this conversation and look, and look forward. We know that a number of school districts in our area, in the county, uh, have moved uh, in the direction of the technology initiative, which we're certainly happy for them. We just know that uh, we want this to be a learning initiative for us, and technology is, is simply a means for us to achieve what we believe is possible. I think this is also a well thought out process that you guys have gone through. So, um, you know, getting a reader, reader's digest version, you don't get that, but um, if anyone would like to talk to you or your staff, Dr. Lamerson, um, I, I thought it was a very well thought out plan. And I don't think Reader's Digest is published anymore, so that's a short version <laughs> for anyone out there. Wow. <laughs> I had that coming for me tonight. <laughs> Before we even get into discussion, I would like to thank Karen. I mean, you've done an awful lot of work, uh, John, you the administrative staff. I mean, this this has been ongoing since last December. The PNF committee and really the board members were coming to almost all the PNF meetings. Uh, this has been very active. It's, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Um, I think, Mr. President, you made a comment at one of the earlier meetings that we're not real thrilled to have the tax issues. Same time, that we're never looking at I was really worried when we saw the early DPI estimates. I think it was $725,000 less aid that we were going to get in our district, uh, which you know I struggle with. It. You know, we had, I don't know what it was even the year before. Do you remember how much it was the year before? It was another. It's, it's on your tax yeah, levy chart. It's a very large amount of money that in the last several years we've been losing for Madison. That, you know, we pay our taxes, it goes to Madison, and it just doesn't come back. It goes somewhere else, um, which was. Concerning, I'm really thrilled about this, the governor's initiative, this Act 46 have returned, what, 447,000 of that? So a decrease was, went from 725 to 277. So much better, I mean, it's still a big decrease that we have to make up for, but um, it's much better than, than I was worried about before. So I'm very appreciative of that. The, uh, the other, the research that you did, Karen, on the middle rate issues, um, I have two thoughts of it. You know, we always want to keep our taxes as low as we can, regardless. Uh, but it's it's comforting to look at what our neighbors are paying in taxes for their schools and saying, you know, we are a pretty darn frugal school district here, which I'm really pleased with, and I don't want that to change. 
Uh, we do a great job. We're, we're spending money where we need to spend it. You know, the, the accolades that we're getting, whether it be from the national magazines or the state DPI and their rating system, is there. We're getting great results uh, for the money we're spending. And frankly, we're spending, you know, many times, if you look at some of our neighboring communities, $500 less per month and more than, than they have. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel comfortable looking at people saying, you know, we get a great bang for our buck in our community. Um, and this is just one of those, you know, charts that, you know, when you start to compare it to other school districts, but like, wow, you know, we're, we are doing a good job. I don't want to pat ourselves on the back because we've got to be very diligent on this. Um, but Dr. Anderson, you're, the PNF meeting, to me, not today, but the previous one where you talked about the, you know, learning initiatives really struck me as that's the direction, you know, we want to keep spending our time and technology on is in integrating that into every kit in our district. And um, I know that was one of the issues that I think for me personally when we interviewed you was very compelling that you had been doing that in Illinois. Um, and I just scratched my head, but I don't know how we do that here. I don't know how we can make that work. And it seems like you've got, you know, and Chris is working on it, people working on this thing. Uh, you know, we talked about it in the PMF, there's major changes that have to occur here. But I think it's a great direction for us to go, and I'm totally supportive of, of, of that direction. I, I personally like scenario five, uh, as I mentioned in the end of the PNF meeting. Um, yes, Karen, we're leaving you high and dry in the sense on the debt service fund, we're capping that. Um, but it's much less of a hold and call out of next year than the million dollars or so we under levy the previous year. And we held out to that money last year. We talked about that money when we under levy last year with the refinance. I think it also should be stated that boards before us um, had really been fiscally responsible to the point where we had fund balance that we were able to use last year to keep the levy down. And um, our fund balance is still within the board limits. So um, not only have we used it, um, used the taxpayers' money, when they needed it, we still have um, a good cushion in there to, to do things that we need to um, with the security upgrades that were talked about earlier. So I uh, commend everyone on this board and boards prior. <clears throat> Any other comments? Anyone like to make a motion? I make a motion that we adopt scenario five of Karen's uh, recently handed out school uh, district levy district. And just, just add to that and adjustments to the budget amendments. And, and the budget, you're right, and, thank you. And adjustments to the budget amendments um, that would result in what we believe to be the 6.05% rate increase. I second. Motion and second, any discussion of any kind? Karen, can you spell that out one last time? I'll let that utilize quickly. Sure. Yeah, you know, we, um, we utilize our revenue limit to the fullest, <coughs> and we're using fund balance out of our debt service, Fund 39, that has accumulated over the years of 175000 So in essence, it's an underlevy of 175,000. And we're, we're basically down from what started out around 10 percent. Right. Um, due to your hard work and uh, administration and uh, committee and board. Um, and Governor Walker, of course, at <laughs> 46, didn't hurt. Um, so we basically be down to what would amount to, uh, I'm looking at my math here, about a 5.57 with an additional uh, 0.48 or a half percent earmarked for this technology-based learning initiative um, that we need to, to do to stay competitive and go for the future. Mm -hmm. I would say we don't want to stay competitive, we just want to leave. That's what our goal is. We want everybody in our show. I don't want to compete, I want to leave. Any other thoughts? All right, we have a
motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your time. Well, thank you. You spent a lot of time. Thank you. All right. Uh, the section of the parking lot is going to be a rain on it and stuff. Now we're carrying all this parking lot. Like. Yeah. Okay. It's finally get weathered. All right. Item I, Superintendent Notes, Dr. Lamerson. Uh, first three items uh, will be this through. Uh, these will be uh, snippets of updates uh, on various topics just to bring you uh, current to various issues that we're working on. If you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to entertain them. This will not be the only time we'll see these. This is simply an opportunity for us to bring you up to date with our conversations. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. And we are going to show a PowerPoint. Uh, let's see what that is. Let's see what that is. Before I jump into this, I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it is to be a part of the school district again. It's not often in my tenure, uh, 27 years of education, that I've had an opportunity to sit with the board where there's laughter. And, and that's exciting to be a part of a board that there's that kind of uh, uh, comfort with one another because that's when great solutions are, are, are discovered and found. You don't, you don't, you don't think creatively when you're, when you're at each other and nagging. So it, it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, district and, and be a part of the board up here. Um, lastly, uh, thanks uh, for approving that learning initiative with technology. It's, it's a critical piece that I believe we need in the district. Um, as we move into smarter balance next year, 14-15, I'll get a, a, into that a bit. We need the technology for those students to take that assessment. Um, and so the uh, approval this evening will allow our students and our, and our <coughs> principals to schedule more efficiently and getting the kids in and out of those uh, labs and use that technology to take that assessment. And the sooner we can get that into our students' hands, the more comfortable they're going to be in taking that assessment. Because there are, believe it or not, many students who, who certainly are, are more comfortable using their handheld than they are actually a, a, a laptop or a, a Chromebook. And so uh, the more we can expose those students to those kind of devices, I think uh, the better we're going to, in essence, be prepared and perform on those, on those assessments. Um, so, so this evening I'm going to talk about uh, every child a graduate. It's an update. You've heard those uh, that phrase before from uh, Superintendent uh, Tony Evers um, at the at the state. And uh, there's been plenty of um, literature going around regarding the Common Core. And I think last week uh, Thursday in the news graphic there was a editorial by uh, the Superintendent. Common Core state standards are right for us. And so. Uh, he, he, there, there's great, I'm going to just pass it around, you can take, take a look at it. There's, there's a lot of publicity, a lot of discussion, um, hearings are taking place around the state, and I think the final hearing is uh, tomorrow night, in, tomorrow night in Wausau. Um, and all the literature that our administrative team is receiving, um, there's, there's articles in there about Common Core. Uh, this one's the Administrator Magazine, it says Common Core Secrets. And it, it talks about what the Common Core is about and, and the, the challenges that we face and, and some of the, uh, um, the uh, what do they call it, the attack that uh, the Common Core is receiving. So I'll pass it around so you can take a peek at that as well. Is this going to be up on a curriculum committee meeting at the, in the near future? Could you talk about um, having a presentation about the Common Core? I'm going to cover that right now to some degree, and if we need to get deeper into it, I certainly would. He's going to be. <laughs> so we, we can get into it. Um, I do want to say that we have a number of ministers here this evening, and, and collectively our knowledge is far greater than just mine on the Common Core. So uh, the ministers that are here, if, if you'd like, please don't hesitate to jump in and, uh, and, sh and, uh, and share your insight. So uh, Tony Evers had a 2017 agenda that was put in place probably uh, several years ago. And there were several uh, targets that this focus 
his efforts focused on, and these are the five targets. Um, and they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can see the first one, the further increased graduation rate um, from 85.7% to 92%. Our, our graduation rate here in our district is 94.9, just for the record. And there's other items that he is uh, focusing on. And the main portion of my presentation will focus on those, those uh, first four bullets. The last uh, one be to adopt uh, fear funding for our future. Um, I think that's, hearing more about that, I don't know where that is, and I haven't heard much about it. Um, th this slide talks about uh, what we need to do to achieve his goals. And we need to focus around four simple and powerful areas, uh, standards and instruction, um, what and how should kids learn, and this basically will, will be the kind of things that I'll talk about, assessments and data systems, um, getting to the smarter balance and the, and the uh, district report card, and school and uh, educator effectiveness, and that's a new educator uh, evaluation system that's coming down. And then the fourth target there is the uh, school finance, which um, is not my cup of tea. Um, I'm going to read some of these slides, and I'm doing it uh, on purpose because I want to make certain that the general public, uh, I know this is going to be broadcast, and I'm not certain how clear this will be, but there are some slides that I certainly want people to know and, and hear, and this is one of the common core state standards, the common, common standards, and, and, and I thought this quote was very timely and meaningful, and uh, it says, building on the excellent foundation of standards states have laid, the common core state standards are the first step in providing our young people with a high-quality education. It should be clear to every student, parent, and teacher what the standards of success are at every school. And I think that's, that's pretty critical, that last sentence, that it should be clear to every student, parent, and teacher. And that's important to know because prior to the Common Core standards, um, every state had their own standards. And so there wasn't consistency across the state. So we would get a student who could move in from any other state, Minnesota, the Dakota, someplace in the Northeast, and there was no guarantee that their exposure to uh, the learning, the knowledge, the concepts was the same as what our CEDAWC students would have received. So there is a great advantage to having that, that common standard across, across the country. Um, why is the Common Core State Standards Initiative important? And I, I think uh, these bullets summarize it nicely. Um, the first bullet, it, it, it makes certain that we are aligned with the expectations going into college and career. So that's really what has been driving the Common Core, getting our students ready for college and, and their careers. The second bullet there, and I touched on it briefly, um, it, it ensures consistency. No matter where the students live, um, they're all well prepared and they receive the skills and knowledge necessary uh, to collaborate and compete with their peers in the United States and abroad. So it, it, it's, it develops that consistency across, across the country, which is essential. Um, just to continue, uh, unlike uh, previous state standards, which were unique uh, to every state, which I touched on in the country, the common, states, common core state standards enable collaboration between states on a range of tools, policies, uh, including, and it lists some of those, so the development of textbooks. And it used to be that textbooks sometimes were driven um, by the uh, state's population. And you probably have heard that Texas, California had a lot to say in what kind of textbooks we would use across the country. The Common Core eliminates that whole piece, and now we are all focused on the same target. Um, in some other areas, you can see policy, uh, digital media, um, and um, I think the critical piece is that second bullet there. It allows us to have a, a comprehensive assessment system that where all students are being measured against the same target. So um, I'm going to take you a little uh, on an activity. Um, so this is Wisconsin Standards for Mathematics, and um, um, I'm going to show you uh, what the uh, old standards look like and what the new standards look like under the Common Core. I think it's good to have a comparison there. Um, the first item here is just that something I touched on that we're talking about world class standards here. And the standards are really focused on higher order thinking skills. Um, and you can see in the middle here, says many of the Common Core state standards begin with the verb understand. Um, and so they're looking at reasoning skills, they're looking at different ways to represent information and explain the concept to someone else and apply the concept. That's, that's, that's what the standards are all about. The standards are definitely clearer than they used to be. When I was a teacher and I was uh, an administrator, a building principal, we only had standards at four, fourth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade. And now the common core standards are, are at every, every grade level. So when we were writing curriculum or developing assessments, um, back when we just had Wisconsin State Standards, if we were working on uh, fifth grade, we had to look at fourth grade standards and, and 
project upwards, and we had to look at the eighth grade standards and kind of unpack those back down to fifth grade. It was very, very labor intensive, and that's where you ended up getting a lot of inconsistency between between school districts. Um, fifth grade in Cedarburg may not have been the same kind of standards that you would find in, in, right next door in Grafton. So that was an item that was very unfair under the old the old system. Um, the new standards are certainly more specific, so now you have standards at, at, at all the, uh, the grade levels. And I, and I will share that with you. Um, compared to the past, we had um, only six total standards um, and, and relied instead on a handful of performance indicators at 40 to 12 million. So here's an example of the Wisconsin model, you know, the standard from 1998. So this was a standard, it's the same standard, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. And when I say the same standard, meaning it was applied to all those grade levels, although the standards were only at 4, 8, and 12. Pretty straightforward, pretty broad. This is uh, one of over 20 common core state standards for mathematics, operations and algebraic thinking and algebra. And you have the grade level down the left-hand side, and you have uh, in the middle of the actual standard. And you can see they're much, they're much more specific, uh, they're, they're, they're much more detailed, and um, they're, they're stating to us what we want our students to be able to do. Keep in mind, they're not telling us what to teach, they're telling us, they're asking us, they're telling us, I guess, what we want our students to do, not, not, not how to teach that. So they want them to write and interpret Merkle expressions, they want to solve real life mathematical problems. Uh, that's different than the old standards. So let me, uh, Get back to my PowerPoint here. Now this is where I make a little challenge, sorry. Um, where am I? I let's see. Sorry guys. Here we so the next the next item is the uh, uh, ELA, which is English Language Arts, and again, a similar type uh, setup um, as with the math standards. Um, and they show. Yeah. Don't think we're going to technology. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me just go see if it's down here someplace. There it is. <laughs> So again, um, these are the standards. Uh, it's a similar format, as I said, the math is that uh, they're world-class standards. They're looking at higher level uh, um, thinking skills. Um, in, in, in the old math standards, students were just asked to respond. Um, yes, no, multiple choice type things. Um, the, these, the, the, the Common Core and Fair standards, uh, again, I said we have at all the grade levels and, um, and, and they're much more specific. And I'm going to show you uh, an example of uh, uh, reading. Um, here's the 1998 Wisconsin Model Academic Standard for ELA. Um, and, and this is how it read. And here's an example. Uh, this only goes compared to fifth grade because we're looking at um, the area of phonics, but you can see how specific it is in, in K1 uh, through 5. Uh, in detailing what it is that our students should be able to do. <laughs> Questions about any of that while I work through this? Sorry. I think for a district that operates at such a high standard, is there any threat at all that actually how the core works is down a little bit? <laughs> That's, that's a great question. And um, for me, I, I, I like um, Board Member Kennedy's comment that uh, I forget what you said, but it was, we're going to be number one. And for me, the mindset is always continuous improvement. So although the state has set this standard, we need to exceed the standard. We, 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 we should not settle for, for uh, what the state is, is proposing. We need, to, we need to excel well beyond that. So to ask you a question, I, when you look at the standards, what the old Wisconsin standards were compared to the new, you know it's, 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 it's a couple, several steps um, more challenging, more advanced than the old standards. So is there any harm, uh, I guess, to, to a district like us? I, I believe so. I think it's, in fact, going to help us when we do get students who are transferring in. Transferring in. We're going to be assured that the students coming from the private school are all aligned to the standards because they're all being assessed the same way. Um, I think if anything, it, it, it does, from my perspective, it strengthens education in Wisconsin. 
from a special education perspective, too, this does give us a clearer benchmark at all of the grades for our students with disabilities, our students with uh, English language learner needs, uh, some of our students who come from a lower socioeconomic status. This really is beneficial to us to help get all of our students to move forward. And do you think this is a good baseline? It's the way in which data is being used in school districts now. As, as you know, we administer the measure of academic progress, the MAP testing. And now um, we are able to get MAP reports um, from districts uh, that are of similar demographics and socioeconomic status around the country. So now we can compare Cedarburg students to other high performing, uh, just high performing districts across, across the country. So we're going to be able to take that kind of uh, larger global look at our students and make certain that they are competitive, not only with those students just here in Wisconsin, but across, across the country. And I think that's, that's exactly how data should be used. Not just competitive, our oh, students well, are going to lead. Well, that's what he said, it's going to lead. I like that. Lead. How, that. How much more workload is this putting on our educators? That's so what I these Because I, my kids come home, my neighbor's kids come home, yeah. and teachers are saying things like, we can't get to that, or we can't do that, or this. and the answer we always hear is because of Common Core. So are we putting extra workload to meet these standards that we could be spending on educating our children? I think part of the, it's, it's a great, wonderful question. And we are part of, and it's later in the slide, but, or in this presentation, we have a curriculum uh, cycle that we are, are on, it's a seven year cycle. And every seven years, although I think we're gonna condense that cycle, we go through curriculum revisions. And when the state standards were here, we had to go through the same type of revision, you know, a few years ago, and now the Common Core is here, and we're going we're going through the revisions as as well. And with anything new, um, there's going to be a there's going to be a learning curve until that comfort uh, uh, is developed. Um, and, and I don't believe it's we're I don't think we're we're increasing the workload as much as asking uh, everyone to do things a bit differently. There's greater integration across the content areas than there's ever been. Under um, and so you can look at developing assessments and not only uh, one assessment that can target content in social studies and, and uh, communicative arts, for example. So you, you're taking one assessment and you can use that assessment to measure two things. So there's a lot of that type of integration that's happening and that's taking time. Um, we are through the, uh, um, the math revisions with the Common Core, so our math uh, uh, curriculum is, is up to speed and um, our Common Arts work, we're in the process of doing that right now. We, we really we need that feedback. So if you hear that, please tell them to go to the principal, go to Todd, come to me, come to John. We need to know what sort of things are in, being impacted because that's the first I've heard that sort of comment and yeah. that shouldn't be coming through a board meeting. We really need to have that dialogue with our staff because I have no idea what you're talking about and I'd like to know <coughs> what, what is it that's um, being negatively impacted. Yeah. I'll get a bit into that when we get into the smart, smarter balance. We're, we're going to be assessed in, in, in 14 15 using the smart balance assistant, assessment system. And, and that smart balance is assessing the common core. So we are part of that uh, assessment. And in order for us to be competitive and to uh, improve our overall standing in the state, we have to be working and, and teaching to the common core. Um, we're not going to get away from that assessment that starts in 14 15. And the plan for the DPI is to have this piece in place as well, uh, the Common Core in 14 15. So we're, we're in a position where uh, we don't have, a, from my perspective, we don't have a choice. So we're going to take that state assessment. And if we do not um, uh, work and uh, understand the Common Core and make certain that our curriculum is aligned with the Common Core, we would be doing our, our, our students and, and, and the district a disservice because that will be reflected in our school and district report card. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're more intimately involved in this conversation than I've been. If 
from an educative standpoint, you can't argue that the Common Core standards aren't more stringent, more demanding than what we have in place. I think this whole conversation is a political issue, for lack of a better term. Would you agree? It almost sounds as if I'm kind of odd now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I, I haven't studied it like you because I'm focusing more on the HR stuff. But yeah, I'm sorry. From an educational standpoint, yeah, I mean, I've read in the paper, I guess, from a, yeah. from a layman's perspective, yeah. it makes it sound like it's a political discussion. It's not an education discussion. You're absolutely correct. And there's an article in the magazine that I uh, handed out that the board members are welcome to look at. There's a great article in there. And um, it, it talks about um, some, of the, some of the states who certainly have taken issue with this. And um, it, it appeared, I, I was surprised um, that um, um, Wisconsin was, was taking issue with it. And I think that you have to question the timing of us taking an issue with it. Um, given the fact that we are so deep into this already, um, it appears, from my perspective, there's, 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 it's rooted in some, at least a piece of it's rooted in some kind of work. It, it's just the, some of the history is Wisconsin was criticized royally because yeah. our standards were so low for so long. And the NAEP test, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, I think, NAEP, was considered more the high level test that you know, we should be using. Well, the Common Core standards are based on that test. We are raising the bar to go to that more national, international level, and now we're like being criticized for that. So it's like, I don't get it. If, if the old standards weren't acceptable, and so now we're raising the bar, now we're being criticized for raising the bar, I'm not hearing what's the better answer, because this isn't a federal initiative. These are state mm -hmm. standards. Mm -hmm. I don't really get what they're suggesting we do instead. Go back to the low standards we had, I have not heard what they're suggesting. And that's why I think it's so political, because where's issue, the better answer? I think an issue is local control, and I'll, and I'll cover that in just, in just a bit. Okay. Uh, this you speaks... Know, I'm sorry, you, you, since you're very familiar with politics in this, do you know what the, 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know the bar has been raised, or whether the bar has been changed? Um, it's, it's been raised, and, it's, it, and when I say it's raised, it's also go, going deeper. The, the argument that has been made with the Wisconsin State Standards is that it was an inch deep and a mile wide, and our kids were very ineffective. And the Wisconsin model, in, in particular, um, they had many different, uh, the statisticians worked their magic uh, for our, our test results in Wisconsin, and they had safe harbor. And when, you, when we made the switch, and Cedarburg didn't necessarily suffer from it the way other districts did, but when we made the switch from um, the WKC standard to the, to the NAEP standard, um, many district scores were, were significantly negatively impacted, um, and, uh, and that wasn't the case here. And I'd argue that in Cedarburg, we're doing a great job. We were doing, we were performing better than Wisconsin standards, and we're going to be performing better than than the uh, uh, Common Core standards. But I, I believe it's, it's it's going deeper, um, and, and there are some aspects of it that have changed, but but it's not an entire change. Not at all. Well, here, here's a perfect example right here. This, this is the common core. This is the state standard in third grade. There wasn't any. <coughs> it's a perfect example. And, and here we are. Uh, this is 2010. Of course, we, we continue to make the revisions, and, and it's really it's now being implemented in the common core. And here's the here's standard in third grade. We never had that before. We had to take whatever standard was here, and we had to back it down to third grade, back it down to second grade, back it down to first grade, back it down to kindergarten. And who knew if we were meeting the target? The target. And they're absolutely right. It has more, it has many interpretations, and it's certainly more, more specific to new standards. Um, here's another example. This is the sixth grade. Uh, same type, same type of thing. We had no standard in sixth grade under the old system. We had a standard in eighth grade, so we had to back that down to seventh grade, and then eighth, and then, and then sixth grade. Or take the fourth grade standard and move it up and, and um, unpack it and move it to fifth grade and then get to sixth grade. So this is a perfect example of how specific it is. And what they're asking us to, to, to do is have our students perform. This is what we want our students to be able to do. Um, and, and they're not telling us what to teach. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that. But this is this is a measure. They're asking us to determine a uh, central idea. That's that's a task. We want our kids to be able to do that. And here's one in, in 12th grade. So what, what does this mean to the Cedarburg School District? It certainly means that um, uh, we are embracing an era of more uh, rigor. Um, the, the standards are more robust. They're challenging. Um, they're not. Uh, it's, it's promoting higher levels of thinking skills. Um, our goal is to exceed the common core in Cedarburg, uh, continue to improve, and be number one. And, and 
uh, we did that. Uh, we exceed the Wisconsin State Standards and those are in place, and we'll do the same thing with Common Core. And we do that through our cycle of curriculum development. We do that by hiring exceptional staff members. We do that by personalizing our learning. Um, everything that you uh, have promoted and uh, allowed the school district to do has created a, a high performing district and will continue to be that way under the Common Core. Um, uh, curriculum control, that's still local control. That's, that's not being dictated by anybody. We still are in a position, uh, they're, not, they're not telling us what to teach. Uh, they're telling us that these are the things that students need to be able to do. So we still determine how we're teaching. Uh, we still are determining the materials uh, that we're going to be used. That's local control. Uh, the same thing with the instructional choices. That's all local control. They are not dictating that at all. Those are things that we, as educators, uh, when we receive our degree, we go to school, we, we perfect our craft. Those are all items that we bring to the table. The Common Core is just uh, telling us what our students need, need to be able to do. Um, consistency, I talked a little bit about that. It's very you know, consistency across the state and across the country, my perspective. And I had mentioned in um, the revision cycle, uh, we are on a seven year cycle and, and we'll continue to be at have a curriculum cycle. Um, uh, every, that, that cycle was really dictated by budget. You know, you're not going to adopt uh, a math series and look at math materials the same year you're looking at uh, commerce materials. It would just, it, it, the budget could sustain that. So really those revision cycles have been governed by, by um, budgetary demands. And as we look to embarking upon this uh, technology initiative, I can see the seven year cycle being condensed to, to probably a two to three year cycle. Um, if, in my mind, to think that you have to wait seven years to put something into a curriculum just, just doesn't. That just doesn't, we don't want that for our kids. I was going to ask you that with the technology, it's going to take seven years to get it integrated. No, it, it, it can't. It can't. We have to be uh, much more responsive. We want to have a responsive curriculum. Um, so to go, to go back to the question, the dollars that we've allocated um, aren't increasing in our district to, to, to uh, handle the common core. We are on a, a cycle already, and we have dollars already allocated. Uh, for that cycle, and we're using those dollars just to make certain our materials, instruction practices, and, and hardware as we, we embark on this learning initiative um, support the Common Core. So, um, the Common Core, how is it going to be measured? It's going to be measured with the Smarter Balance Assessment System, and that takes place in 1415, uh, which is next year. I'm going to give you an example of a question. So is this like a sample of what the students will actually see? This is what they see. They see a swim of five of them. And there's the question. It's an open response. Any guesses on what grade level this would be? It's good. So it's fifth grade. And there's and, and what they do is they, they, they break it down for you. Uh, these are samples uh, of test items. It, it gives you an explanation of what it is. And when there's a constructive response, they actually give you, uh, they provide you a rubric as to why uh, this, this response uh, is, is appropriate. Again, something that we didn't have access to under the old system at all. And I'll give you another one, just to give you an idea. Hmm. Any guesses on the grade level? Grade three. That's a higher standard. I'm going to move through a couple of them. Uh, there's a couple others that are pretty good. I can remember going over eighth grade tests when I was yeah. in principal and they didn't ask questions like these no. <laughs> in the old model. So the standards are setting us up to be able to do this. This is a fifth grade. And I'll share. You could go through, and this, this, is, this is all on the DPI side. So no, the smart, no, it's right there no. up, up in the left hand side, you can see the Smart Balance Assessment Consortium. You can Google that and you can go in there and look at this. And our teachers have been made aware of this. Uh, one of our professional development days, 
um, recently uh, was spent by some teachers, and all the principals have this, and our goal is to, to have our teachers look at this and be able to uh, assess the types of questions, the structure of the question, the format, the vocabulary, and uh, how are we doing on our assessments that we've created in our district? Are we embedding some of that same kind of structure, format, vocabulary in our assessments? So um, the teachers are looking at this um, and uh, thinking of ways and, and, and adjusting their assessments uh, and certainly their instruction in the curriculum to ensure that we are aligned with the Common Core and our students will be able to do this. Is that a calculator? We're actually calculating an answer? Yep. And then, interesting. So if you want to look at... Uh, they let them divide, but not... Is that for calculating or just for taking it in? Just for putting yeah, the answer in the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So when a student's taking this, would they have the ability to open up a spreadsheet and work do some calculating that way, do you know? I think if there's any if there's any any tools available, they're gonna prompt and provide them. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. So this is grade four. And I'll just show you some English language arts. Uh, so this is this is uh, English language arts. You have the passage on, on the left hand side. Pretty extensive, and, and this is this is uh, at a lower grade. When you get to the high school level, we're talking. There are several screens of text that need to be read, <laughs> and um, this is fourth grade. And again, you divide a rubric when you're looking at the constructive response. Can you just go down again, real quick, on how long that passage is? So when you think about this, all, all of these, this entire assessment's being done online. And so um, I know we had a, a bit of a conversation about the different technology that we're using, and, and Kirsten is here, and she had showed me a link that um, you think about taking this on an iPad. Um, if you're going to teach something like this on an iPad, we have to have a keyboard on the iPad. Because they were showing is just a typical iPad. When you have the actual virtual keyboard, it shrinks the screen, shrinks the text, and everything. That's not going to be uh, conducive to students' comfort in, in, in responding. So, um, if we do embark on the iPad, we'll make sure we have to look at potentially get, getting a keyboard to add to it. Um, I think we can. I'm just going to scoot up a little bit uh, so you can see a few of them. So this is the, the passage here, and then it's um, select three sentences that show that Naomi is worried she has done something wrong. Fourth grade again, and um, take a little bit to get to twelfth grade. See, so there's a video clip in there. So it's it's pretty extensive. It's all geared towards uh, the higher order thinking skills and, and multiple steps. It's it's not just simply. Um, multiple choice, which which maybe many of us uh, were used to. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, certainly or will. Or to the, especially the sample question. Sample question. For sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Let me get back onto my PowerPoint here. Uh, set smart balance. Um, so that's smarter balance, and, and of course, the smarter balance is going to measure just how well we are aligned with the Common Core, how well our students can do on the Common Core, and um, it's going to be reported out in the district and school report cards, and those are the report cards that you've received previously, and the, the information is on our website. We're continuing to do an analysis of those, of those scorecards, um, because as you know, some of our buildings are extraordinarily well, and, and a few maybe uh, dipped, and so digging deeper to find out what's the explanation, why was that the case. And it seems to be surrounding uh, a few subgroups or student groups and limited English proficient, students with disabilities and economically disadvantaged. And so we're looking closer at the, close, more closely at those, those three groups. And I'm uh, looking at other data sources as well. And I'm looking at data sources across uh, several years. So we want to know just how well are we doing as a district in meeting these students' needs. Not only looking at the WKC or Smart Balance soon to be, but our MAP scores and other kind of curriculum based measures. And from there, we're going to be able to determine exactly what are the areas of strength and what are the areas we need to improve upon. Um, it's these student groups um, that um, are the groups that we need to focus on and focus our energies on. And there was a, a citizen here earlier this evening who was talking about the class sizes and some of the challenges facing the class sizes. And there's certainly a lot of challenges. Um, with, with, with groups of students, there's always 
uh, some way to, to provide uh, better services, and sometimes there's the financial backing behind it to do that. And for example, if we're looking at proficiency, we have Title III funds, which are federal funds that we can use to address um, ELL students and students with disabilities. With students uh, with disabilities, Joe has obviously a budget for special ed, and ec economic disadvantage, that's Title I. So we're really looking at those funds and thinking how can we use those funds differently to address the needs of these, these groups so we can improve their overall achievement. Um, which ultimately would, would come out on our uh, district and, and school report card. Um, the last piece I'm just going to touch on is the educator effectiveness. Again, one of the goals uh, for the state superintendent is to uh, have an evaluation system in place for our teachers uh, in 14-15. That's next year. And there are um, two models that are out there. Uh, one is the deep guy model, uh, which is based on Charlotte Madison. Uh, framework and uh, another one's from CESA 6 and it's based on Strong and Associates and we are doing an analysis of both models. Uh, I don't think one is more superior than the other. There certainly are some nuances and um, pieces of it that make it much more user friendly and I think conducive to uh, customization. So when we're looking at those evaluation systems, these are this is some of the areas that we're considering. Uh, built on the Danielson framework, all the great work that the district has done over the years, we want to continue to see that uh, extended. Uh, the, the evaluation system has to be flexible and customizable. I think that's critical given our unique situation in, in, in uh, Cedarburg that we've had an evaluation system and, and something uh, called pay for performance. So I think it's imperative that we take that into consideration. We have, it has to be user friendly. We, want it, we do not want it to be cumbersome for our administrators or our teachers. And most importantly, it's got to be a meaningful, a meaningful process that furthers teacher growth. And, and those are the components that we're looking at for the uh, uh, Educator effectiveness evaluation system. Um, so you can see next year is kind of a busy year. We have the Common Core taking place 14 15, we have Smart Balance Assessment coming into play, and we have the uh, Educator Effectiveness Evaluation Model. So it, it, it's purposeful. The, the, the state did this on purpose because they want to ratchet up the expectations uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Any, uh, anything to add, um, uh, administrators? The only thing I'd like to add is that. Uh, the reality is that every school district in Wisconsin and nationally was a Cedarburg who would have who would not have common core. Um, this was an initiative from the State Department um, uh, heads and governors uh, to try and address what they uh, what they concluded was a frenzy of standards. Uh, when the standards movement came in into place, everyone jumped on the bandwagon. States had standards. Math, math subject area, content area has standards. English teachers have standards. Science teachers, social workers have standards. A researcher out in Denver, associated with McCrell, Marzano, did an analysis, highly regarded researcher, did an analysis of all the standards. If any school district wanted to simply implement all the standards that were out there for public education, not have a student master the standards, simply be acquainted with the content from that standard, that student at Cedarburg High School would not graduate at age 18. That student would have to stay until he or she was 26. And that's when, when Todd says everything was an inch, it maybe was a quarter of an inch, a, an, and 18 miles wide. These standards were going in all kinds of different directions. This is, and for Cedarburg, we've always built up from standards, whatever they were. So we'll continue our, our historic process of building up. So this, this will be something that we'll, we will be a part of, but we will always build up from. But this really is to address other situations nationally and statewide that needed some coherence in their curriculum. Um, and as, as Marzano said, we, you know, at the end of the day, you want to have guaranteed and viable curriculum. Viable means that you can accomplish a year's worth of curriculum in a year. Too often, the standard said, we have three years of curriculum, and you have a year to get it done. I mean, that's not viable. And so teachers had to cherry pick. So now the other districts will have an opportunity to be like Cedarburg. That is, when we have a second grade class, we'll have a second grade curriculum that can be delivered in a, in a year. And the same thing in terms of it being guaranteed. That is, in a second grade class in Cedarburg, whether it's a Thorson, Parkview, or West Lawn, that second grade experience should be not identical, but should be more similar than dissimilar. To be guaranteed, this is the kind of opportunity you have in second grade and kind of experiences you'd like to have. 
that, is, that has not been happening nationally. And so this is an opportunity nationally to bring coherence to the curriculum. It really muddied the water when the, the assessment became political. Not, not, the, not the common core standards and the, the politi politicism of the assessment did not come from Wisconsin. It came a little further east. And it's, it has white before house. Um, that's where it became political when the assessment was brought in. At the time the Common Core Standards were, were discussed, the states would then select their assessment. However that the states wanted to handle it. But um, the, at, at the time when Race to the Top came on, on board, there was just buckets and buckets of money put aside to have national assessments. And that's where things became, became difficult and confusing from an administrator's point of view. But in terms of the opportunity to bring standards, for us, uh, this, you know, we will build up from these. Uh, the, uh, and we want our students simply for the assessments. Some of those kinds of questions they've never really seen in that kind of format before. So we want to make sure our students are acquainted with that kind of language and that kind of pattern of thinking and assessing that don't get fatigued, for example, in terms of knowing what to do. So uh, we have some work to do, but it's, uh, uh, I, I, I'm confident we're in a really great place. Yeah, it's great work. Thanks, I need a little bit of that. I just wonder if we need to revisit the budget for the full of budget class. These lies are the We thought we moved the bed from Karen's office. She's done the first thing. Uh, the next item, um, as you know, uh, we, have, we have a need to convene a crisis team um, with the situation, a uh, great deal of sadness at one of our schools um, with the loss of grant. Um, and I appreciate the, the kindness and the moment of silence earlier in the meeting. Um, I simply, I, I would like Joe simply to uh, refresh like, your knowledge in terms of what happens with the crisis team and who's on that crisis team and what that role is. Um, but before he does that, I, I really want to commend Joe and thank him, uh, as well as Superintendent's Council uh, for uh, being at the school, um, Joe being at the school every day, um, being the facilitator for the crisis team, uh, and commend the staff, uh, Candy, our teachers, uh, and especially uh, Susie for uh, just an exceptional job uh, caring for kids. Uh, and caring for parents. Um, it, was, uh, um, it was an incredibly sad, uh, sad uh, time, and, uh, and uh, the goal was simply to be able to uh, allow everyone to grieve in the way that would be appropriate, uh, and uh, that uh, everyone can have wonderful memories of, of, our, um, of our student. So, uh, um, Joe, would you just kind of refresh the board's uh, knowledge of, of how that, uh, how that uh, process works? Before I get started, I would like to echo uh, uh, your uh, wishes and, and for this uh, force and staff. You did an absolutely fantastic job with a very difficult situation. Um, from the classroom teachers to the, uh, to the magic teachers to <coughs> Candy to the secretaries to everybody, they really rallied around uh, each other um, through this and helped each other support it. Uh, support each other through a difficult time. Um, the district does have a crisis team, um, and it is in place to, uh, to address the passing of the student or a staff member. Um, it is a team of uh, district administration, uh, counselors, and school psychologists that really try to come in behind the scenes and provide support to students and to teachers so that they're able to move forward with the day. Um, uh, as a team, we uh, essentially take over some of the management responsibilities of the school. We try to help them plan for what the next steps should be to think through their responses. Um, uh, in, in situations of student death, there are uh, a lot of uh, good intentions, um, and it, it's to really try to help the school um, and, and all members of the school community really put those intentions into an appropriate framework for the student uh, who has passed and the staff members passed 
and the classmates and the teachers and such. Um, our team uh, convened uh, last week, um, and I'm sorry, not last week, the week before, Friday morning, uh, after we got the news. Um, all of our counselors in the district uh, were present, all of our school psychologists were present at that meeting. Um, we talked about how we were going to support the students of Thorson, how we were going to support the students in the district um, at the other elementary schools, at the middle school and the high school, who may have uh, come into um, uh, some level of grief over the past in the grant. Uh, we also touched base with the parochial school. Uh, in this case, it was St. Francis Borgia, uh, but we would reach out to any of our parochial schools uh, to try to provide support to them um, when and if possible. Um, uh, like I said, our team came together in the morning. We came up with a plan for Friday. Uh, we briefed with uh, each other on Friday afternoon and then came together again on Monday morning with the Thorson staff to try to help them, support them through what Monday was going to be like uh, when students came to school. Um, I can't say enough about our school counselors uh, and our school psychologists. Um, through a very difficult situation, they were able to stay very objective. Uh, they were very caring and compassionate those that needed them, but they were able to remove themselves from the situation and help think to what that next step would be. And if there was a, um, uh, a key role that the crisis response team plays, it is thinking to that next step. Um, the school that, that, that experiences this is definitely in a state of crisis. Um, oftentimes, um, planning and thinking is not necessarily associated with that. And, and it's very good for that school, that school team, to have people that they can go to that are not immediately attached um, uh, to the tragedy. And, and our crisis team was able to do that. Um, school psychologists, uh, unfortunately, in Cedarburg, we've had a number of students pass. It's been some time since we've had that. Um, but we do have uh, one school psychologist in particular, Pat Sorensen, who has uh, a lot of experience going way back in our district. Um, and he was able to provide some great insight into, into the team um, and, and help everybody and plan what's going forward. Um, again, I've, I've followed through, uh, checked in with Candy with classroom teachers, and they have a very good response to this, if that's, if that's possible. They're very supportive of each other, constantly checking in on each other at the school level, reaching out for help when they need it. Um, and it's, it's been a Very sobering experience um, uh, for us as a school, but also to see the school rally around. I'm, I'm talking from a third, distant third person perspective. It's very encouraging to, be, to see how they support each other. I can echo that as the uh, Thorson parent. Um, thank you, you know, and uh, John and your staff, and especially uh, uh, Kenny Gibson and the Thorson staff um, in handling that terrible situation so well. I think it meant a lot to um, the students, um, some of them are my own children, and um, also the family that was involved, so I appreciate that. Um, appreciate that very much. Uh, our, our hope is that we uh, never need to convene the crisis. Um, but I was very grateful for the role that everyone played, uh, the contribution that they made, the phenomenal parent support that um, is poured over for, um, for us, for the staff, for the kids, for one another. Uh, it was uh, um, it was actually quite remarkable uh, to watch that and, and I appreciate that very much and our, our, uh, uh, our sorrow uh, and, and sadness continues with the family as they continue to heal. Um, but I wanted to share that with you. Does anyone have any questions? Or, uh, no, I just, I just uh, want to thank everyone. Uh, you know, this takes quite a toll on everyone in the community, and especially those closer to it, and the, and the crisis team, too, and the teachers, and the administrators, students, parents. And uh, just appreciate all the uh, support given by the district um, to Thorson kids and, and to the parents, and to the community in general. Um, it's very much appreciated. The next item, and Diane was uh, what we'd like to bring your attention is simply the calendar considerations for 1415. Um, the, um, uh, we're having administrative conversations regarding next year's calendar. Uh, we started with the administrative team, but before we move uh, too far down the road, um, 
Uh, Conrad wanted to bring this to our conversation. Are there things about the calendar that we definitely should uh, be thinking about uh, in terms of your expectations? Uh, our goal is to, think, uh, to bring this perhaps for approval in December ish. Uh, hopefully, even earlier. For, for yeah, I, I, originally, I hope to have it ready tonight. So okay. I, I need to apologize because when we first discussed it, we're already starting to get questions about the calendar for next year. It's always a hot topic with parents. They want to make their plans. I was very optimistic two weeks ago that I was going to have a calendar for you tonight to approve. And I, I'm told it's kind of like sausage. It's like if you like a good broth or Italian, that's really good, but you never want to see how it's made. You don't, you don't want to see how a calendar is made. And so I, I really just whipped this together for you just to get a feel of what we're dealing with. And these are actually cleaned up. Um, but. Originally, we started with the idea that we just kind of fast or, or, or project forward a calendar that's traditionally been in place. Honestly, I don't think we can afford to not take every opportunity to do everything we can to try to improve our opportunities for our students. So um, we're, we're going to go back and revisit it, and it, it, it's not going to be radically different. We're not going to be proposing year-round schooling or anything like that, but we really are asking some hard questions about things like early release dates. You know, is a half-day of school an optimum model and, and is instruction going on those days worth it and our parents inconvenience and some of those kinds of questions and where do we put professional development days into the calendar and what are those going to look like um, there's so many little nuances that you don't appreciate like uh, you know just even tonight while we're at the board meeting i got a message <laughs> that we got to take into consideration homecoming week because you don't really want to have professional development day on homecoming friday so those types of details are literally coming in as of today. So we'll, um, I just want you to get a feel for some of the things that we're looking at. And you, I think you get a sense for the complexity of it. And hopefully in November, we'll be able to come forward with something that we can recommend uh, to be adopted. I, I'd really rather not wait for December if we can avoid it, because yeah. I do think people want to start planning. Mm -hmm. So if you have any strong preferences, I don't think traditionally school boards generally get involved in the details, the nitty gritty of the calendar. Because um, there just are so many things that you're not going to be privy to as far as the schools and what's going on. But if there are some big picture things that you'd like to give us some guidance and direction on, we certainly would like to know that. Because um, philosophically, there are certain things like uh, half days is a big one. Some communities, you know, they, they just don't do not like the concept. They feel it's a lost instructional day. You have the late start at the high school, which you won't notice on this calendar. We don't incorporate that. But in a lot of communities, you know, they're adamant that there be some type of uh, dismissal to build in PD time during the year, whether it's a late start or an early dismissal. Um, so really, um, anything that you'd like to make sure we know and consider, we'll be happy to do that. The only questions I'd ever have, what changes are you making? You sure. know, you're starting to talk about some of those, because that's how at least I process it. Okay, we have the last year's calendar. What tweaks do you want to make to whether it's professional development or the half days? We, we will give you a thorough review when we come forward with the recommendation, and we'll tell you why we're recommending the things we are. I really do ask you not to distribute these because you never want somebody to get excited about something that accidentally was written in stone. Just create a problem. I'll take it back with your model. I'm happy to collect it. And um, the uh, issue of the calendar, what we want to do is uh, if there's anything that is uh, significant to that we definitely need to make sure avoid talking about or whatever. Uh, we want to know that so we don't have to you know, have a conversation or something. Uh, last uh, two items, uh, paper performance. Uh, the survey was completed. We have 151 respondents. So we have a 75% return, which is unheard of. So we're absolutely thrilled. Uh, we're reviewing the data uh, as we speak. I'm going to send you tomorrow a copy of the survey so that you can see it. Um, the um, the uh, comments, um, people were very comfortable, um, you know, filling in the open-end uh, questions, and, uh, which is great. Uh, there are some trends that we're kind of seeing, but we, we need to look at it from different vantage points before I bring it to you. My goal is to be able to simply share with you some of the the, the, take, the big takeaways um, at the next meeting. Um, the expectation still is that we will have a draft 
plan ready in January. Something written out in terms of what this is going to look like moving forward the track. Um, and the goal is to incorporate the, some of the themes, the takeaways, to the best of our ability that seem to surface, that, may, that resonate with us, that we make that make sense to us, and we can do from from the, the teachers' uh, uh, thoughts and comments. Um, and uh, so I want to let you know we're on track. Uh, timing is working out perfectly. Uh, we do have focus groups that uh, will be set up in November. We'll get some dates out to you. Uh, there'll be after-school focus group meetings um, that we'd love to uh, have a board member sitting at the table when we ask certain questions. The questions will be formed based on the survey. Um, and uh, so we'll, we want to make sure that we use that survey as a platform for what, what, what do you think you mean by this? Um, and um, um, I could share some now that would be a little premature, but some things are coming out of the survey that are going to be really helpful to us uh, in terms of things that teachers feel that they need in order to accomplish what they think a pay for performance plan should accomplish, which universally, not universally, there's a huge majority that believe that they would like this plan to be something that would retain staff. They, the goal of this in terms of, of retention, they, they want to stay. So, you know, there's some wonderful things that are coming out that, would, that simply will indicate that, that we have more in common than, than differences, which is, which is great. So, uh, uh, so we'll, we're, we're moving down that road, we're making progress. It was uh, the staff, uh, the staff really made some great contributions, okay? So, any questions about that? We're on track, based on what I... Great response, right? Yeah, it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. The last item is the mission. I just want to share with you one slide. And um, you don't need to do this at still. I just simply want to give you a format. Because last time we talked about the mission, I wanted to give you an idea of, you know, kind of how this, this is going to unfold, at least in my mind. Um, when we talk, for example, about our mission, the first issue is that we're to have a lifelong learner. Well, one of the things that we did administratively was uh, instead of, of uh, um, saying, just assuming that that was the right phrase, we said, well, what word would we use if we took out lifelong and we replaced it with something else? Okay. And as we talked about it, these are kind of the phrases that came out. So the mission, for example, could include, as a lifelong learner, one of the things, and, I, and we're going to end up, my goal is to end up with two. So there would be two categories or descriptors for lifelong learner, if that's the right term, or still a term we're going to use. But it's related to the fact each student will experience an exemplary dynamic academic program. Exemplary is already in our mission. But it's an exemplary dynamic academic program that promotes the following dispositions. We talked about the fact that a lifelong learner, for example, had to be curious. You can't be a lifelong learner if you're not curious about what's going on. So curiosity was something that we said was really important. We said hypothesizing. We said creative contributor, questioning, persistence, internally motivated, risk taker, metacognition. You think about one's own thinking. You seek the truth, and you're strategic about how you're looking at this. Now, we shouldn't have that many, so many words. So that's when we're we will start calling this now. What are the things that are most meaningful to us in that description? But the way we started it was say, okay, instead of a lifelong learner, what would it be? It's a curious learner. It's a hypothesizing learner. It's a creative learner. It's a questioning learner. It's a persistent learner. So that's how we tried to figure out what we thought administratively this would mean to us. Uh, as we look at coming up with those two categories um, of, uh, of, of descriptions. What's really important to me, and this is not me typing, that's why it's so slow, um, <clears throat> that it's as evidenced by, because I'm really interested in delivering something, you know, that, that there's a deliverable, I mean, there's some, some outcome from this. And for example, we may say that if that first statement in number one 
even though we're going to probably delete some of those things and maybe, you know, maybe add others, I don't know. But at the end of the day, if something like that is what we want, is a lifelong learner, then one of the evidences we might say is that students take ownership of their learning by monitoring and adjusting their thinking. Now, how does ownership, how, what does that look like? Well, a student might actually be the one that explains the math scores to the teacher. We're actually looking at a database that allows students to access their student achievement data alongside teachers. Because if a student is going to take ownership, if that's important to us, then they need to have the skill set and they need to have the capacity to be able to monitor and adjust what they're doing. Students continuously ask questions, higher levels of cognitive taxonomy. They seek evidence to support those answers and are critical consumers of information. We, we may say that if that number one is there, and, and kids need to be curious, they need to be questioners, they need to be persistent, they need to be seeking the truth and strategic, when we walk into classrooms, we better see students asking higher order questions we, and seeking to answer those questions by themselves and with the support of others. And students know how to be, be able to get information and be critical consumers of information, not just repositories. We may say as an evidence by that students analyze their performance data. We may say that students gather feedback on their performance, they set specific goals, communicate the plans for achieving their goals. Actually, that's part of what is now being required, uh, that students do in fact set goals. But maybe we're going to say one of the evidences of a curious child and an exemplary dynamic program is that every student knows how to gather feedback and how to do it. We talked today in a meeting, but wouldn't it be wonderful in our district if you walk up to any first grader, ask them how they're doing, how you doing in math, <clears throat> but instead of the first grader saying, I don't know, ask the teacher, that first grader describes for you what he is working on or she is working on in math, what they will be working on in math, what they expect to accomplish in math in first grade. And it's an you know, at some point, we need to think about empowering students to be able to take ownership of their learning. Developmentally appropriate. It's one of the many wonderful things that technology allows us to be able to do at a level that was un unheard of and probably unable to do in the past. So, simply wanted to let you know that at the end of the day, as we keep moving down this road, the goal is that um, we would we have three categories in our mission right now. And the first one is lifelong learning. We'd like to unpack lifelong learning in two categories. Make it really clear. So we all know what that means. And within those categories, I'd like to have several bullets that you believe truly represent that category. And maybe one of the bullets that I'm presenting tonight may not be, that's fine. But the goal is that it's really clear when we walk in the classroom, when we talk with teachers about what classrooms in our district look like, we say, you know, this is the kind of experience we want our children to have. And we want you to be a part of this if this, if this resonates with you. Um, because there will be some teachers that do not want kids to the question. They want kids who are compliant. Nothing wrong with compliance, but that may mean that we're much more than just compliance in our district. If we say that questioning, hypothesizing, being curious is really valuable to us, because sometimes those classrooms can look and sound very different. And if everyone's on the same page, everyone's on the same workflow, everyone's on the same page in the textbook, nothing wrong with that. It just means maybe that's a different kind of learning experience, and that's what we do. But that's what we'll decide. Um, so at the end of the day, there'd be one piece of paper for lifelong learning. 
two categories, as evidenced by, that you believe, and then we'll look to our next category. We'll have three sheets of paper that indicate this is what our mission looks like in our district. It's really clear to us. We kind of we pretty much know what a lifelong learner looks like in our district. You know, super question, you know, uh, our kids take ownership of their learning, or whatever the, the evidences are. And along with all the other common core issues we're working on, this is going to drive us. This will drive us to where we need to be in terms of providing an educational experience for our kids. So I just wanted to share with you that we're, we're unpacking this administratively and kind of the organization of it, at least in my mind. Does that help a little bit in terms of where we might be going? Yeah. Okay. Chad, do you think you can teach desire? Um, <laughs> I, I, no, <laughs> no I, I don't think you can. I'm just even wondering through the technologies. Is there a way to, because you know, I mean, this is really great stuff. But I didn't think of my own kids, to be honest with you, and the desire they have to learn is not great. So how do you engage a kid? How do you, I mean, I love this stuff. But do you have a desire? There's got to be a desire in there, right? There, there, this is my, this is my point. Um, and you guys kind of know, it's a great question. I don't think you can, I don't think you can teach desire. Simply because I truly believe in free will. If somebody doesn't want to do it, they won't do it. What I think we can do is build on the curiosity that every kindergartner brings to the system and every first grader brings to the system. It's in those classrooms, they're just soaking up everything. And one of the things we need to make sure that we work on it, curiosity is really a piece of what, what is important to us. We want anyone from the outside coming into our classrooms and, and being able to say, I have never seen such curious students in my life. I, I don't think you can teach desire, um, but I think you can teach what to do if you have a desire in something. So what are the tools, you know, how do you, how do you hypothesize something, you know, um, how do you take risks, you know, things like that, you give them tools that when you do have that desire about one time, you know, that you can attack it. And I think getting that skill set is, is very valuable in that regard. Is it is a lot of desire in something? Right. What you want to be able to do, I think, is be able to translate that so that they can transfer that desire and, re and redirect it in other areas. But most you know, most of our children come to us with this insatiable appetite to know something and to figure things out. I mean that that's the key. When you look at the brain research and how our minds work, we're wired to learn. I mean you are born trying to make sense of this reality that you're born into. The intrinsic desire that the brain has to make sense of life, it's there, it's innate. You don't even have to teach it. The question is, what's happened to it? Why do some kids keep it you know, their entire lives, and others, you, you got to drag them kicking and screaming right. to, to learn anything? I think that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves as public educators is, number one, don't ever let that fire go out so the question never comes up, and why is it going out in so many kids? Because it's, we are literally wired to learn. The brain wants to make sense. When you learn about the dendrites and the synapses and how those things are always growing and learning and improving. I mean, the, the way the mind works, just biologically, it's fascinating stuff. Um, so when kids aren't letting that happen, it's it's the external happenings that have caused that. And and for too many kids, school is a chore. And, and that's where the learning goes out the window. And we have, the question teachers and administrators talk about is it's a motivational question. Yeah, I think it's the same when you're asking, Mark, with a little different, you know, semantics. But it's like, yeah, is it our job to motivate somebody? Are we supposed to motivate the kid? Well, it's a great question. Um, you shouldn't have to. Why do we need to? What do we do to make sure it doesn't get to that point in the first place? Because right. John's point is well taken. Most kindergartners, they're still wired, still in that mode. Well, it's kind of a rhetorical question. Just oh, no. Kind of answers. <laughs> but, but at the same time, where I look where education's going and where the technology is going, it's going to provide us better opportunities to engage kids to want to learn. Yeah, so this is a learn. very practical question, Mark. Critical if, question. If, if, if the board, for example, says, one of the dispositions is curiosity. We will be having conversations, and we'll be the only district in the state to have conversations at TV about what's the curiosity level of our kids and your students in your class. 
we'll be doing well. I guarantee you. This is not a topic that's coming out of DPI and Madison or any place else. So that's why it's important for us to know is that important to you. Uh, what's important to you out of not necessarily that list, maybe there's there are other lists, but once we know that's important to you and that's how you view a lifelong learner, then we're going to be about the business of, of figuring out how, how to make that happen and just get better at it every year. Um, that's why this this journey of conversation on the mission is important um, because we'll be very clear about it and, and everyone will know. Yeah. Like I'm learning, you got to be curious. Come and see the schools. You're going to be a curious too. That's, we expect to see that. These are the various things we're going to look for that are important to us as, uh, as, uh, as, as we you know, pay attention to that disposition of our kids. Well, I would say once it's finalized, we need to figure out how we're going to market this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, spread the gospel, right? If, yeah, once, yeah. if, if what we were teaching, we're later. If what we were teaching was so exciting and captivating and interesting and engaging and applicable, we wouldn't have to ask the question. Well, what would do we want to do? Can you do you teach desire? Okay. One cool. thing, uh, as long as we're doing the common core, the way we the way we do things at Sea of Bergen, we're going to build it. Yeah. If there's any common themes across the common core as far as rubrics or any 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 way that you have to display the skill or anything like that. Um, you might want to consider those when you're doing that as evidence by. Yeah, that's great. So look across there and maybe there's stuff that Daniel's in or the paper for performance that we can kind of synergize together and um, kind of look at it from all angles and, and bring it together. So we speak the same language. Appreciate that. Uh, last item under uh, H's other. Um, just wanted to alert you and then ask Todd just to briefly comment on it. Um, we've identified uh, the Superintendent's Council a list of things that are topics for us that we're working on. You know about most of them, but one that you might not know about is uh, an interest on the part of our principals regarding scheduling um, and, and looking at how we spend our time. Um, time is an incredible resource. Um, and um, so uh, in a conversation with the administrative team um, and principals, uh, such as leadership council, uh, we uh, talked about, you know, is this something that should be a, a district-wide issue or just a school-specific or whatever? And um, I, I think we've ended up with the, the fact that um, there's so many interconnections, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, in terms of that, that journey, could you just share that? It, absolutely, it's kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, Conrad has been doing a great deal of work in, in looking at the schedules and analyzing the instructional time that's available. Um, to, and maybe you can summarize that, Conrad, but it's making certain that we are, um, the amount of time that the teacher's spending um, working with students in high school is similar to that same amount of time at the elementary and, and middle school. So we have some consistency in the amount of contact time between the instructor and, 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 and student. And so that, that, that's helping us frame out how many minutes of the day we have to, to use um, for instruction. And um, uh, in, in speaking to the building principals, there's a number of items that have come up. And, and one of them came um, from the uh, um, curriculum committee of the board, which is a foreign language at the elementary level. There's some question about whether we had the capacity to have foreign language at the elementary level. Um, and not only that, but with um, uh, the, the ratchet of expectations and the standards, we have to make certain we're doing everything we can to meet the needs of those students who are not achieving. So do we have time in our schedule for interventions? And and uh, what does that look like? So is there a period at the elementary, middle, or high school where we can provide um, ongoing support, uh, targeted intervention, research base, to ensure that those students are closing that achievement gap? Uh, if a student is behind in his or her studies, if they continue to school about their studies, without us really targeting and providing uh, uh, the intervention that's necessary to close that gap, they're not going to close that gap. The slope is never, it's, it's never going to get there. It's just going to run parallel. So what types of things can we do uh, within our schedule to provide uh, intervention time for uh, our students? And so when we're looking at our schedules, they're fairly tight. And they're extremely tight. So um, in speaking with our administrators, um, we're, we're looking and exploring ways in which we could possibly uh, add an intervention period at all of, all of our levels, elementary, middle, and high school. 
Um, and when I say intervention, that doesn't necessarily mean that students will only be getting uh, intervention for, for an area that they need some assistance, but it might be an intervention period that's more on the, uh, the extension uh, side of things as well. So enrichment, for example. Sometimes these periods are called pie time, uh, prevention, uh, um, uh, intervention, extension. Um, and so um, what can we do to make certain that we're meeting the needs of all of our kids and almost like personalize the learning. And when we talk about adding uh, technology, that's going to you know, give us even greater opportunity to personalize that, that, that instruction. Um, but that is one of the main driving forces behind looking at schedules, um, both elementary, middle, and high school, is that intervention period. What can we do for those students um, that, that are not meeting um, the expectations? And I touched on that briefly in my PowerPoint. When you're looking at some of those subgroups, we have, to, we have to look at time. How can we address it, uh, those needs and get them a double dip, if you will, or a triple dip of math? So they're not only getting the Common Core uh, instruction in their regular classroom, but they're also going to get another period of 30 minutes that's very targeted based on the data. Uh, and, and we are looking at that area and providing that intensive instruction and monitoring the progress to see if we are closing that gap. So that's the driving force behind, um, one of the main driving forces behind, forces behind uh, looking at our space. So I agree to say maximize uh, teacher time, that would be also maximizing one-on-one -on -one time, some group time. Um, you know, we talk about the increasing class sizes, and I think always a good, a good method to deal with that is to, you know, break off um, one of your groups of students to go over one of your tougher, you know, subjects, let's say math, and um, to have five or six in a group with the teacher, and not have everyone else just sitting out there doing their own thing, which, Take about two minutes for my son before he, you know, be doing something else. So I think at that point, then you utilize the other resources in the building, right? So maybe you structure, you know, gym class where you have, you know, part of one one teacher's class and part of another's, you know, and you come up with all these kids that are in there while the other ones are getting some intensive mess or things like that. And I think. You know, that's not something maybe we can change right now um, because we've already scheduled. Yep. But going forward, um, those are obviously things I'm sure you guys have thought of those. But I think those are, are good tools for us moving forward to deal with class sizes. Okay. Not to have them in that room where the intensive learning is going on, mm -hmm. get them out or take, or take the students out that are mm -hmm. in that intensive learning. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of ways to do flexible groups. Flexible group yeah. 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 You know, when you think about a lesson, there's some home group instruction, but once that's done, yeah. let's break apart and, 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 and use, using technology, sure. using other resources, um, address their needs, mm -hmm. without all sitting in, in, in the same yeah. classroom. Yeah. And, and, and I think when we look at our schedules, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, we, we are looking at increasing the math time at the middle school. Right now, they have a math period of about, I want to say 40, I think it's 40, 45, 45, 45 minutes. Yeah. So, and we need to get 60 minutes at least of math. That's what the research says that you need in order to have kids um, make the gains that are necessary. So there, there are issues like that that we're looking at across the K-12 level when it comes to instructional time. We need to increase some periods, and so uh, we're, we're taking a deeper look at that. The question we have to answer is how do you make time a variable? Because yes. normally that's a constant. Every kid goes to school 180 days, gets the same amount of minutes in each of those different subject areas. Well, no wonder, how do you close a gap if everybody keeps getting the same? Mm -hmm. So making time a variable through our scheduling is a key issue, and the other one, Todd, I mentioned, is summer school. I mean, we have to look at what we can do to have that summer period be a major, major time to get the interventions, to get the enrichments, to have stuff stick and to have kids not slide. Please understand, both of these are gonna be at least two year projects. I don't think we're gonna see any drastic changes by next fall. Um, but we're, we started the conversations, we got a, a national expert that we talked to this week. Um, we'll keep coming back and letting you know how that progress is going, but we what's, have to do it. Yeah, what's the next step? Um, the next step, we, we, uh, we as kind of said, we spoke to this uh, national uh, guru on, on scheduling who's worked with many districts, high performing districts in, in our state and across the country and world. And um, we just received uh, his information, and so it was shared with um, our, our smaller administrative team. We're going to come back together and decompress, and then we'll decide and, and, and speak with John what would be the appropriate next steps. At some point, Obviously, you need to, the board needs to be informed, and I was thinking maybe the venue of the curriculum council um, would, would be the uh, yeah the committee of the board. Yeah. The committee of the board would be the venue in which we would have discussion in 
great detail about that, but it's really really in infancy stages of what, what makes the most sense. Do we want to spend the dollars associated with the consultant? How much heavy lifting do we want to do inside of our district? And what kind of expertise do we have? And, and so it's doing that kind of initial assessment. Have, have you done any uh, analysis and then you had initial conversations with the uh, principals? Mm -hmm. um, can you can you get it? Do you have an impression yet of what's happening to the time? Where is it going? How much is spent on certain things generally? Yeah. Um, is, is, it, is it even possible to figure out where the time is going in a, in a given day schedule? Well, kind of taking a deeper look at it from, from sure. the instructional standpoint, I can tell you I haven't been an elementary principal, transitions, <laughs> recess, you know, both morning and afternoon, and um, some of those periods that um, are, are probably stretched out and can be a bit more condensed. And if you were to really look at those three areas, you could probably come up with about 45 extra minutes sure. in a day. But, it, but as far as instructional time, though, you, you can, you know, how much is in the, like, yes. say, mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. Yes. What, what are those categories do you have? So it, right now, language mm -hmm. arts, um, common arts, we're looking at 90 minutes. And in math, we're looking at 60. Those are the two big blocks, 60 minutes or 75 minutes of math. Those are the two blocks. And then we want to That's what we're shooting for. That's yeah. not where we're going. Oh, yeah. No, but maybe, do, you, do you know where? Yep. OK, so maybe that would be helpful for us to kind of see if we can break down each day at yeah, the elementary, middle, and high school level. See, yeah, well, the high school is always tricky because of the drop, so you've got to factor that in. But sure. yeah, we can give you exact numbers. That would be great. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting, it's an exciting endeavor to, to, to market by because when you schedule buildings, you, you tend to take in a lot of factors, and unfortunately, the scheduling your block of math and your block of literacy was always the last thing to get scheduled. You know, those, those larger blocks, you know, you fit them in, you get, so you get 15 minutes of literacy here, then you got a recess block, and then you get a few more minutes of literacy, then you might have lunch, and so it's actually, taking a look at the schedule, it can, can make a huge, huge difference in, in how we're meeting the needs of our kids, and how to use that time differently when, mm -hmm. when you do have larger class sizes. So is that something that, that you have prepared already? Or That's we're almost ready. Oh, okay, yep. is, that, is that for the curriculum committee? That's, that would be the goal, would be to bring okay. it there. Yeah. Yep. When do you think that might be? When is the next meeting? Um, I think we have one uh, January. Yeah, we'll have it. We'll have it. He's trying to schedule a time point. Thank you for your assistance, Justin. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your assistance, Justin. There's a tip. 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 I meant to send her. Thank you for your assistance. I also want to just make sure that it's very clear. When you go to the PIG and they, they say that we're changing the high school schedule next year, that is not true. <laughs> okay. The high school schedule. Uh, is up for review and conversation. Any change that will be brought to you so that you're aware of what's being contemplated, the earliest would be 15, 16. But now's the time for us to talk about it, and we believe it's, it's better to do that systemically rather than isolated, do one school, finish that, and move to another school or another grade level. We'd rather look at things in a more holistic fashion and um, so I, I just want to make sure it's very clear. Um, we, we simply want to make sure that we do our fact-finding due diligence. We, we make uh, really good decisions long-term, but there is there is no, uh, uh, we will not rush to this. And the earliest, especially at that, uh, at that building, would be 15, 16 for us to consider something different. If, 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 that's a big if. Is everyone okay with that? Human growth and development, the survey. Um, we didn't get those back. We felt that was something that was individually, we felt that was a staff issue. Um, Todd gave us a synopsis of it. I can't tell you that the negative responses were in the minority. Um, at this point now, uh, we have a 15% return rate. At this point now, the um, we recommend some changes for maybe the next time doing it. Uh, there are some concerns about it. And now the teachers will meet and they're going to tweak. Actually, you just met. Mm -hmm. um, to tweak it, to tweak it for the um, being able to give it for this year. Mm -hmm. um, Ted also gave us some priorities that, that he's looked at. One of those being e-books. Uh, we just, we talked about online courses since college the kids are taking a lot of them and preparing our students for that. And then uh, data warehouse. Um, where you can look at students' uh, longitudinal data 
their accomplishments. Um, and that's something that maybe part of Skydiving that they gain for the camp. That's what we have. Great. PNF committee, Mr. Bray. Look at the report. Look at the report. We covered it all the way. Yeah. All right. Well, then the next item is to adjourn into executive session. It is anticipated that the Board of Education will adjourn closed session pursuant to state statutes 19.851C to deliberate specific personnel issues of public employees over which the school board has jurisdiction or exercise its responsibility pursuant to Wisconsin Statutes 19.851C to deliberate salary negotiations pursuant to Section 19.851E of Wisconsin State Statutes. Approval of the Executive Session Minutes September 17, 2013 and Executive Session Minutes July 23, 2013. I will now accept a motion to adjourn into Executive Session. I'll move to continue the session. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Thank you for staying.